And we're almost there. I got to click on the got yeah, it button. Got to say like, got it. This <laughs> Perfect. This mouse is just like. That's okay. Don't <laughs> hey, everyone. Mouse. And hey, everyone. And welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ. And this is where I introduce you to amazing pe people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the second Sunday of the month, which means it's time for Nutrition Insights with Dr. Peter Rogers. And today he's going to be talking about whether or not your cell phone might be hurting you. Please welcome him to the show. How are you doing, Dr. Rogers? Get over here. Uh oh, <laughs> he just went away. I hope he comes back. I know. I'm back. I'm back. I just got mouse is like uh, playing hide and seek with me. I can't find it or anything. Okay. All right. Well, I hope you, I'm glad you came back because I certainly can't give this topic. If it was a cooking lecture, maybe I could. So, um, is your cell phone hurting you? I have one right here. I sure hope not. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I just want let me see if I can go back to that last slide. Um, well, okay, so basically I couldn't go back to that last slide, but what happened was I, I actually found a paper because you'd asked me last time, do I like going into saunas? And I said, I'm scared. I'm worried if I overheat my uh, cojones, that might have a negative effect. I found a paper showing that being in a sauna does lower the sperm production from the testicles, but it was reversible. Still, you know, my attitude is why take a chance? But I know a lot of people say good things about them. And Dan Gable, coach of Iowa wrestling, used to think it was a good thing for his wrestler. So, but I'm, I'm going to pass on that one. Um, and then what are we talking about today? We're going to be talking about the effect of EMF, which is electromagnetic fields. Uh, we'll talk about cell phones as well. It's a major part of it, but um, it's actually a surprisingly big deal. It's one of those things you start reading about it a little bit and then you don't want to stop. Um, can you hear me? Is everything okay? Can you see my slides? I can hear you perfectly. I see a gorilla pounding his chest and an elephant. Okay, great. Um, so. One of the things here is what I would say is the problems with the vegan approach to health. I think vegans have done a great job, the low-fat vegan community, understanding nutrition. They've been very good with epidemiology. They're good with exercise. They don't talk much about personal goals, freedom, religion, and health, which are important, but there's a much bigger issue. I think they're weak on the topic of toxins. That is an underrecognized problem, and that's both the herbicides and pesticides and non-organic food, and even some inorganic. Some of these food additives, the flavorants, the dyes, preservatives, contaminants. So these are big subjects. The issues with tap water, water filtration, air pollution, chemtrails. Um, but the 800-pound gorilla in the room is EMF because you can't avoid it, okay? And where does it sit? It sits wherever it wants. So I know you've had a couple lectures on your channel with that lady, uh, Teodora Scadaro, Scarato, and, you know, she did uh -huh. a good job. I saw that. Um, mine will be coming from a different angle. I'm going to so not cover so much of things she said, but I'm going to go into a few other things. Mine will be more of a scientific technical talk than a, than than this practical talk. But I think it's worth it to hear this because, you know, there was there was a a sense of where does a person get strong determination? Uh, strong determination from comes from having a clear purpose in mind, okay, and understanding what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then your sort of subconscious is aligned with your conscious mind. So, anyways, here's the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so EMF is electromagnetic field. EMR is electromagnetic ra radiation. Okay, there's non-ionizing over here on this side of the chart with the green. And that means that the waves don't have enough energy to knock an electron out of a molecule. Okay, when they're ionizing, they can knock an electron off a molecule. When you knock an electron off, the molecule becomes charged. It becomes ionic. So that's why it's called ionizing radiation. Okay, um, the earth itself has a magnetic field. And then sort of the next step up over here down in the corner is uh, AC power, alternating current, like 60 hertz in all of our homes, okay? And then you get into the radio stations, you know, AM radio, FM radio, and then you move into the sort of the beginning to overlap almost with the radio frequencies and the microwave frequency. So cell phones are characteristically microwave frequencies, and that's an important point. Your cell phone typically is a low power microwave transmitter. Okay, then there's the visible light spectrum and then ultraviolet light starts merging into, you know, what can cause a sunburn um, and what can start to be ionizing in a sense. And then things like medical x-rays and radioactive material. Okay, so this is the electromagnetic spectrum. What we're most concerned about is the microwave uh, band, if you will, like with cell phones, Wi-Fi. But we also care about the radio frequency from you know, radios and regular household electronic because they also have some electromagnetic field that can be relevant to humans. Okay, here's a picture uh, that shows what some of this is all about. 
Um, you know, you have your cell phone, which a lot of people hold up right next to their head, a bad idea, the cell towers, the routers, the smart meters, the so-called smart devices in one's home. And the biggest thing to know about them is they open up voltage-gated calcium channels in your brain and everywhere else in your body. You've got the most voltage-gated calcium channels in your brain, in your gonads, and in your heart. So that's bad. Like you put a cell phone in your front pocket, <laughs> you can be activating the voltage-gated channels in your heart. Okay, and calcium is a big deal. We'll talk more about it on the upcoming slides, but basically calcium is like a light switch. When you increase cytoplasm calcium, it makes the major function of that cell be activated. So if it's in a nerve cell, it'll cause transmission, you know, release a neurotransmitter. If it's in a muscle cell, it'll cause contraction. Um, if it's in, you know, other cells, whatever they do, if it's in the pineal gland, the release of melatonin. Okay, so... You know, we primarily think of nitric oxide as being this great thing. And we're going to talk about that. But there's another group of really good scientists saying, oh, no, it's a terrible thing. It's the worst thing. So we're going to have to try to reconcile that problem. And I said that, you know, today I come to you like Isaiah, you know, a comfortable prophet dressed in his robes. OK, but in the future, I'll be like Abinadi in the sense that it's becoming harder and harder to find good information on the Internet, more and more sort of bad information of nonsense and commercial corporate interest is 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 crowding out the truth. The truth is weak because the truth is poor. There's no money in telling you the truth, okay, about food, about nutrition, about epidemiology. So I'll tell it to you while I can. Learn while you can because there's a lot to know. All right, so getting back to Dr. Esselstyn, he wrote this great book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. He did this heroic research study, showed reversal of coronary artery disease, or at least lack of progression in all these patients. He looked at the epidemiology around the world and saw in the plant-eating countries, they don't get coronary artery disease. And he said it's a foodborne illness, coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis in the heart, causing myocardial infarction, most common cause of death. So all this was wonderful. And then more recently, he started talking about eating green six times a day. And he started hanging around that Nathan Bryan guy, who's sort of like the most famous expert in the world for nitric oxide. And uh, he sort of added to the list of deficiencies. When you think of deficiencies, you know, the, all the chumps say, oh, you got to get your calcium for osteoporosis. That's bogus. Oh, you got to get your protein. You're going to be you're going to be weak. You're going to get sarcopenia as you get older. That's bogus, too. Um, you need your good fats. That's a typical way to trick idiots. OK, just so you know, those are the fake deficiencies that you hear about all the time. The real deficiency in nutrition typically seen in Americans are lack of potassium, lack of magnesium, lack of fiber, and lack of nitrates. And that's because these are all the things you get from plants, and Americans don't eat enough plants. All right, so now this slide right here um, is, uh, is of nitric oxide being synthesized. And it's sort of what we all learn. We learn that you've got NOS, nitric oxide synthase enzyme, and it makes nitric oxide, and that's a wonderful thing. It's a vasodilator, opens up your arteries. It's also antithrombotic, prevents clots in your arteries. You know, the best way to prevent a heart attack, what more could you want? And we'll learn there's some things that are bad that'll inhibit it, like, you know, excessive dietary fat, um, cigarette smoking, dietary sodium. Those are all bad. And some of you might have heard of there's things that uncouple nitric oxide synthase, so it can't make nitric oxide effectively. And that's sort of like what I would call introductory knowledge on the subject. All right. And then the next thing one hears about, and, you know, Nathan Bryan taught a lot about this, the pathway. You eat the greens. On the back of your mouth, you got bacteria that sort of change the you know, nitrate into nitrite, you know, NO2, and then it goes in your stomach, and the stomach acid helps convert it to nitric oxide, NO, that's absorbed into your blood. It's transported perhaps on your RBCs, and it has a systemic vasodilator effect. Um, it also turns out from sunshine, you get nitric oxide, and I think that's partly why you feel so good when you first walk out in the sun, you get this diffuse vasodilatory effect. OK, so that's all well and good. And he says, you know, don't use F minus in your toothpaste, your water, your mouthwash. Stay away from that. No antiacids, especially PPIs. OK, so then. My mouse is still invisible to me. And then the idea is sort of that one lives happily ever after. You know, all our arteries are open. The Johnson works. Our pressure is good. Everything is great. And that's sort of where we typically leave the story about nitric oxide. But what I want to share with you is there's an other group of scientists who see something differently. And, you know, there's some people who said, is Esselstein crazy? What's he talking about eating green six times a day? Who could do that? You know, he's so tall with the thick glasses. He looks like a giant grasshopper. He's 90 years old. Has he gone senile? You know, is he like Don Quixote with Nathan Bryan, like Sancho Panza? Are they really for real? Okay. And here's the guy, here's the group saying this. This is Martin Paul. Now, Martin Paul did not say those things. Okay. I'm, I'm just saying though, but Martin Paul is the big guy going around saying that 
Nitric oxide is the worst thing. We must reduce nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is causing terrible diseases. Okay. So I heard this, you know, big contradiction. I tried to figure out, you know, is either one of these guys, uh, you know, not coming up with solid information. But when I read Martin Paul, I was like, wow, this guy is really bright. He's a physicist and a biologist, and he's really bright. Um, and he went through thousands of papers to make this conclusion that nitric oxide is this terrible thing, and it's causing people to become demented. Um, it's causing people to become infertile. Okay, so then the question becomes, you know, how does one reconcile these two seemingly uh, opposite uh, positions, okay? And you know, sort of like you've got two ways of looking at things. This is a Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish Socrates. He would describe things as either or situations. You're either married or you're not. You're either pregnant or you're not. Um, and he's a very one way or the other type of guy, but he's a brilliant philosopher. And then here's this other guy, Hegel. And Hegel is the guy who came up with the synthesis. You have a thesis, antithesis, antithesis, and can you make a new synthesis? You know, figure out how to merge the things. And usually I think Kierkegaard's a much better philosopher, but I think that in this case, um, the ideas of Hegel are actually going to probably be better. And so this is, um, could this all be true? Could nitric oxide in one way be a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? And how can we try to keep the good Dr. Jekyll and avoid the bad Mr. Hyde? Because the reality is there are some major issues with nitric oxide, but the nuance is important. The incidence of Alzheimer's, let's call it dementia, is going up through the roof. I can tell you, I see so many demented people, so many cognitively impaired people, they're off the charts. My internal medicine uh, friends will tell me virtually all of their patients over 60 are cognitively slow. Lots of their patients over 50 are cognitively slow. You hear people joking in the United States after 50, oh, I'm having a senior moment when they can't remember stuff. It's considered you know, just part of aging. Um, and what this guy, Martin Paul is saying is he's saying it's because of nitric oxide. Um, and, and I can tell you, everybody says, oh, do cell phones cause cancer? That's the wrong question. What I mean by that is breast, brain cancer is so rare that that's not something you really need to worry about. What you need to worry about is cognitive impairment because that's like ubiquitous. That's super common. Okay. And, and here's papers, you know, and also letting you know, this is not just Martin Paul. Martin Paul, I think is the, is the best speaker, writer, and scientist on these subjects, but there's lots of other ones writing about this. You know, here's a paper, they're calling it digital dementia from electromagnetic fields. Okay. And, um, you know, uh, here's a guy, by the way, by the name of Alan Frey. Back in the 1970s, he showed that electromagnetic fields that, you know, conventional type exposures that we are exposed from the modern devices, they uh, will open up the blood-brain barrier. And that's always bad when you hear something opens the blood-brain barrier. It's kind of like leaky gut, leaky brain. That means toxic chemicals in your blood have access to uh, your brain parenchyma, your brain tissue. Normally, your brain tissue has a microenvironment highly uh, conserved such that the neurons can function effectively. They need precise ionic gradients in order to fire their action potentials precisely. So you don't want an open blood-brain barrier. And quite often, the same thing that opens up the blood-brain barrier opens up the gut barrier. So that's a double whammy. You've got a leaky gut, toxic chemicals getting across your intestinal barrier, and then having access to your brain because the blood-brain barrier is open as well. Okay. And then anything that's round like a ball has a barrier on it, your testicles, a woman's ovaries, and your eyeballs. Okay. So these things are all, anything that's bad for your testicles is probably bad for your brain and for your eyeballs as well. And by the way, when I look at demented brains, almost all of them, not almost all of them, but a huge percent um, have uh, at least one cataract surgery. Okay. Um, and, and it's very routine to see both cataract. I see both cataract surgeries, poor dentition, patients probably demented. Okay. Um, Here's a guy by the name of Leif Salvert. He's a new neurosurgeon from Sweden. And he was interested in treating brain tumors like glioblastoma multiforme. And he was interested in what opens the blood-brain barrier because something that opens the blood-brain barrier could potentially be useful to him to allow increased access for his chemotherapy medicines into the blood-brain, into the brain parenchyma to treat the tumor. Okay, and he was quite surprised that he kept testing these electromagnetic fields and they were opening up the blood-brain barrier. He was rather shocked by it and... Um, Anyways, here's a picture he drew. It's kind of like the, the Munch was the name of the artist, you know, the scream showing all this EMF exposure. And he says that this is the greatest experiment on humans in biology in the history of mankind. And he thinks it's insane that we have ramped up EMF so rapidly. He also describes EMF as a way that people can get headaches because lots of people have headaches and it's unexplained cause. He says, if you open up the blood brain barrier, you will allow access to your brain parenchyma from blood proteins, things like albumin, things like fibrinogen, the blood clotting, clotting protein becomes fibrin and that can cause irritation of your brain. The meninges can cause a headache, okay? 
one of the first things you could do to, I would do is I go through the list of leaky gut, avoid all those things. And that helps protect your brain. Don't do anything with brain trauma. You know, that's all going to potentially make things worse. Here's one of his paper, Leaf Salford on uh, opening up the blood brain barrier. If anybody wants to look that up, he's got some lectures online as well. Okay. Now here's the big statement from the big guy, Martin Paul. Martin Paul says this massive increase in EMF from so many things, from the cell phone towers, the cell phones themselves, from Wi-Fi, smart devices, smart meters. He says he believes it's insane. He says that you can very rapidly make rats demented with these electromagnetic fields. And he says, why should we expect anything different in humans? He says that, you know, typically Alzheimer maybe has about a 30 year latency period. He says that EMF will accelerate this latency period. He even says, if you stopped all this Wi-Fi right now, he thinks you would still have this continuing uh, massive increase in dementia from all the Wi-Fi and cell phones and cell phone towers and EMF fields people have been exposed to. He's actually predicting that. He says that having EMF in the schools is completely insane. He said it's one of the stupidest things that ever been done in the history of mankind. He believes that this is going to sterilize many of these children. And he also says, you're going to see people demented in their 20s from all this EMF exposure. These little kids who've grown up with this. Okay, so that's these are big statements here. You know, so it's a big motivator to get the, get the Wi-Fi out of your house or at least have a switch to turn off at night. Um, and they said you could hardwire everything. They said everything in your house could be hardwired and, you know, uh, cities and whatnot could use fiber optics to handle this problem. So here it is. This is this is uh, Martin Paul giving in a lecture. I read his book, by the way. It's a pretty dense book. I don't know, 400 pages or something, but it was really dense. Biochemistry, biochemistry, biochemistry. It was, but it was good too. I went through the papers. I was impressed by it. Um, he predicts that there's going to be like a major drop in societal collective, collective brain function due to this tremendous EMF we're all being exposed to. And he thinks that society is going to progressively have some de deterioration of overall cognitive function. I thought that was shocking, though. He said, you don't want your kid in the school with Wi-Fi. He says, your, your kid's at risk to become demented by the time they reach their 20s. That was a kind of an amazing statement. Okay, a little bit about antioxidants versus oxidants, because part of what we're talking about here is going to be oxidative stress. So oxidative stress, I, I give it to you like a, a seesaw. It means there's an imbalance between the amount of oxidants. Those are an oxidant is something that steals an electron. It's a chemical typically with an unpaired electron in its outer orbital or outer orbital, and it wants that electron. So it goes around trying to steal it from another molecule. Antioxidants are things that give an electron to the free radicals, so to speak, and prevent them from oxidizing anything else or causing problems. And of course, as usual, you get all these things from the plants. I'll explain why in a moment, but your vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, beta carotene, okay? And then you also have some antioxidant enzymes. The two main categories of oxidants are ROS, reactive oxygen species, and RNS, reactive nitrogen species. You're also going to hear a lot about NO, nitric oxide. It is a free radical, but We'll explain why it becomes relevant in a moment. And ONOO, that's peroxynitrate. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the pathways that Paul talks about are the no o no pathway, which is just nitric oxide peroxynitrite pathway. Okay. All right. Now, here's the deal with antioxidants, why you get them from plants. Because imagine you as a human are standing out in a hot field on a sunny day, 100 degrees out. You would say, this is hot, too hot for me. You'll go walk in a tree in the shade. But the plant can't do that. The plant has to sit there in the 100 degrees of the sun all day long. Its only ability to respond is to produce chemicals, antioxidants that protect it from the, the intense heat and energy of the sun. So that's why when you eat a plant, you get those antioxidants versus if you eat an animal, it's already used them up. Here's a diagram also showing what antioxidants are all about. So this right here with the red central nucleus is a unstable free radical, has an unpaired electron and it's outer orbital. It's in red. And it's eagerly seeking around another molecule to react with to steal an electron from it. An antioxidant is a molecule that's usually a bigger molecule with a lot of double bonds. I'm showing it right here, uh, vitamin E in this corner, vitamin C in this corner. And you see they've got several double bonds, a lot of oxygens, and there are big molecules. And the point of that is they've got a lot of room to delocalize the charge. So they can give away an electron and become a so-called free radical themselves. But because they're able to delocalize the charge, they don't become hyperreactive, and then the reaction will just fade out. When free radicals themselves interact with other molecules, just routine molecules like the, the fatty acids in your plasma membranes, 
they initiate what's called lipid peroxidation chain reactions. So they always cause a chain reaction because they steal an electron from one molecule, then it steals an electron from another molecule, and then it steals an electron from another molecule. And you can trash a plasma membrane that way. You can also trash proteins that way and damage DNA in that same way. So vitamin E is sort of lipid soluble. It works especially inside of membranes. Uh, vitamin C is more water soluble. It's more polar. It works like in the cytoplasm. And an important concept I want to share with you right here is about the idea of the last cam the last straw that broke the camel's back. What I mean by that is people often say, well, I did this and it was no big deal. I had, you know, I had a little bit of beer. I had a little caffeine. I had a little bit of, you know, um, you know, this pie, a little bit of pizza, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm okay. And look, you could do whatever you want. But what I'm also saying, a lot of things in the biop, in the, in the human body, they kind of hit a threshold and then they, then they go they go bad, all right? And what I'm sort of saying here is you want to avoid everything bad as much as you can so that you don't sort of hit these thresholds and start losing brain cells, losing, you know, your uh, functional ovaries, losing your sperm, okay? Because um, a lot of times, you know, it's hard to get it back, okay? And, and the last straw that broke the camel's back is, is highly relevant. I'm going to show you mitochondrial inhibitors, for example. And I'm also going to tell you why doctors don't know any of this stuff. If you look at the standard biochemistry textbooks for college students or medical students, they won't even mention any mitochondrial inhibitors, or in some cases, they'll mention some research, you know, uh, pharmaceutical. Okay. But what I'm trying to tell you is I very quickly go into literature. I'll find 45 inhibitors of mitochondria, and many of them are common. You'll see about 30 of them are common. All right. So this picture is just showing all roads lead to Rome. Okay. When you're, when you're in Rome in Italy. All right. And what I'm talking about here is in the human body within cellular physiology, all roads lead to calcium. Okay. Here's calcium in the center. Calcium, there's lots of things that activate calcium because they're trying to turn that cell on. You're trying to turn a cell on, you want to increase calcium. If you're trying to turn a cell off, you want to decrease calcium. And there's lots of ways to do that. And when good things activate calcium as they're supposed to, that's normal physiology. But when bad things activate uh, calcium, you know, ischemia, lack of blood flow increases calcium. Um, leaky gut leading to the whole Douglas Kell thing I talked about in a previous lecture that'll increase calcium, excitotoxins. I'll show more of this in other pictures, but I'm just letting you know, there's a lot of things already activating increased cytoplasm calcium. And when you start pushing that over, like with these uh, electromagnetic fields opening up the voltage-gated calcium channels, your calcium goes up too high and you will start initiating harmful cellular processes. And so, you know, you remember the movie, The Lord of the Rings. And one saying in the movie was one ring to rule them all. Okay, and what I'm saying in, in brain physiology, and in muscle physiology, there's one ion to rule them all, and it is calcium, okay? The other ones are secondary players. The sodium, the magnesium, the potassium, they're all just going around doing their jobs to make sure things are right for calcium, okay? All right, now here's a picture showing more detail of all the things that increase cytoplasm calcium. And so we know the good guys, we learned, like we said, about eating the dietary greens for their nitrates. We know that going out in the sunshine increases nitric oxide. And so that's the so-called good nitric oxide. And it is good 99.9% .9 of the time. And that's what you do want increased, all right? But there's another type of nitric oxide, and that is produced typically by INOS, inducible nitric oxide. I'll explain the difference in a moment. And it can be useful to fight an infection, but it's often activated by other causes of inflammation, for example, and then it does a lot of damage to our cells. But I just wanted you to get a sense. Look at all the number of things on here that are activating increased uh, calcium that are not good for you. All these, these excitotoxins, things like caffeine, MSG, aspartame, some psychiatric drugs, excessive psychological stress, sleep deprivation is a, is a, is a stress equivalent, okay? Uh, beta amyloid protein, which that can be a, occur from leaky gut. Um, what else? Uh, the EMF is opening up those voltage-gated channels. And the reason why Martin Paul says they're so bad is because they don't just open them up momentarily. You're sitting there exposed to that stuff all day long. So you can have chronic opening of those channels. And it creates a lot of work for your body to get that under control. And then if you superimpose on top of that, more things to increase uh, calcium, it can be a real problem. A lot of these cleaning chemicals are toxic. Um, they can open up the, what is called the trip V1 vanilloid channels. Okay. Capsation is the classic thing associated with that. Um, hypoxia, of course, more people start getting hypoxia of their brains as they get older from atherosclerosis due to diabetes and hypertension and whatnot, which is going to decrease oxygen delivery to tissues. When you don't have enough oxygen going to the tissues to make ATP from your mitochondria, 
you don't have enough ATP subsequently to propel your, your sodium potassium ATPase in your membrane. And then that runs the other pumps. I'll show that in a second what that's all about. But you see what I'm talking about? The last straw that broke the camel's back. You've already got all these little minor problems, some which you don't even know about. And so you don't want to make it worse. You want your body to have all the reserve it can get. Mitochondrial inhibitors, as I show in the corner over here, are a big deal because they decrease the cell's ability to produce ATP. And when the cell can't produce ATP, it can't maintain the ion pumps to pump excess of calcium out of the cell. And you, you start becoming at risk for all these major problems here. Okay. All right. Now here's a normal neuron. You know, you start over here on the far left and that's going to be where the cell body is, the nucleus, the DNA. And then right where the first uh, sodium channel is, Na plus is natrium in Latin for uh, sodium. That will uh, start a action potential at the axon hillock and it passes down the axon of the neuron to the synaptic terminal. And once it reaches the synaptic terminal, it'll open up this calcium channel. Calcium come into the cell. And once the calcium comes into the cell, it'll cause a neurotransmitter to be released across the synaptic junction. And then it'll interact with the postsynaptic uh, cell with its receptor and exert an effect upon it, okay? And that's how neurons work. That's how neurons communicate. All right, and humans are much more electrical than people give them credit for. You know, imagine somebody was standing by the road, they got hit by a car, now they're laying down, they're dead. The only difference is they know they've lost all their electrical properties. They're, they still have their same chemicals, okay? And so the electrical aspect of, of life is much ignored, okay? We can monitor the brain with an EEG electroencephalogram, the heart with an electrocardiogram, EKG, okay? Nerve conduction studies for looking at peripheral muscles. Every individual cell has its uh, plasma membrane gradient, like in a neuron, negative 65 millivolts. In the mitochondria, 160 millivolts. So what I'm saying is this electrical component of cells is very important. That's how they do their work. This is how a cell does its job. It has a plasma membrane gradient here, a negative uh, 65 millivolts. And that's maintained by the KN ATP as K for potassium. Collium is the Latin word for potassium. And then natrium, sodium. And so it's pumping out three positive charges of sodiums to each two that come in. And the point is, this builds up a negative charge on the inside of the membrane. It's like a battery. They have charge, separ charge separation across a, a bar uh, barrier. And then when the ions are moving in and out, that's the equivalent of a current. So what I'm saying is by establishing this ion gradient across the plasma membrane, it is then coupled to, for example, the NACA exchanger. NACA means NA for sodium, CA for calcium. And that rapidly can pump uh, calcium outside the cell. But you can see here, if we diminish the ability to run this pump, uh, the sodium potassium ATP is, we will dissipate that gradient. We won't have as big of a charge gradient or as big of a chemical gradient. The difference between sodium concentration outside the cell and inside the cell. Normally it's about 10 to one. Sodium is 140 outside the cell and it's about 14 inside the cell. So if you dissipate that gradient, you'll get a, a progressive accumulation of calcium inside the cell and you'll start running processes that you don't want run. You'll be overactivating the neuron. And this can predispose a person, for example, to anxiety. Okay. That's why, you know, some of these anxiety and these psychological effects, they're not necessarily emotional. They can be biochemical for these reasons, excessive intracellular, you know, calcium in the cytoplasm. Okay. Now here's showing a little more detail. This is a neuron at rest. And the key point of this slide is just what we spoke about a moment ago, how the NACA exchanger rapidly pumps uh, calcium out of the cell. You also down here at the bottom have the PMCA, plasma membrane calcium ATPase. And that's a little bit slower of a pump, but it's, it's also quite important for pumping calcium outside the cell. Then over here towards the left of the cell, more towards the center of the cell, we have the endoplasmic reticulum. And you see in vertical letters there, the word circa. Circa means sarcoplasm, which really refers to muscle. And then ER, like pretty much almost all other cells, is endoplasmic reticulum. C is for calcium, A is for ATPase. So circa means sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. And everybody just calls it circa. Okay, and what that is, is that's a pump to pump calcium out of the cell cytoplasm into the endoplasmic reticulum. Again, the purpose of all this stuff is to rapidly lower calcium. Calcium is normally about 15,000 times higher in concentration outside the cell than inside the cell. So you open up a calcium channel, it'll zoom in really fast. The cell will uh, carry out some activity and then you wanna pump that calcium out real fast so that the cell does not continue being active when it shouldn't be. Okay, and you'll notice that all of the calcium pumping systems are dependent on ATP and that's because it's always pumping against a gradient. To pump the calcium out of the cell, you have to pump against a 15,000 times concentration gradient. To pump the calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, you also are pumping it into a high gradient because it's very concentrated in the endoplasmic reticulum there. 
So the key point of all this was you need tons of ATP to get rid of all this calcium, okay? About two thirds of the, of the ATP in a neuron runs that sodium potassium ATP pump. There's tons of them all over the membrane and a very high amount of the re remaining ATP goes to run in the circuit pump and the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. And then lots of other things are just coupled to that. That's like the energy battery uh, to get other things done in the cell. Okay, now this, this slide shows a little bit more. It shows that glucine will bind to something called uh, glutamate will bind to something called the NMDA receptor. And that's uh, the major calcium channel related to glutamate, okay? You've also got the AMPA receptor, which I have, you know, coming just before the NMDA receptor. Typically, the glutamate effect on that first will cause depolarization of the neuron. It'll cause uh, a decrease in the gradient of that charge. And let's say it goes from negative 65 to negative 40, for example. And as the cell is depolarizing, then the NMDA uh, channel will start to open up. The unique thing about NMDA channels, it's for calcium. AMPA is for sodium. Okay, there's also magnesium bound to the center of the NMDA receptor. And as the cell becomes less negatively charged, the two plus magnesium is less attracted to the center of that neuron. So it'll pop out of the mid part of the channel. And now the NMDA channel will open up and it'll allow calcium to come in. Okay. There's other things happening here too, like the G protein coupled receptor, but that's also just going to increase calcium. So for our purposes, that's that's all we need to know at this point. Okay. Um, once the calcium is elevated, this is just an example of all the different cells. They do whatever their job is to do. The mast cell releases histamine. The pancreas releases insulin. Skeletal muscle, smooth muscle around your arteries. They all contract heart muscle. Okay. Platelets themselves become more activated, ready to clot. So raising calcium in the cytoplasm is a big deal. Okay, now this is just a close-up of what happens at the synaptic junction. The presynaptic neuron, it gets that wave of calcium coming in, elevated cytoplasm calcium concentration. It'll release glutamate. Glutamate will diffuse across the synaptic cleft. It'll bind the receptors of the postsynaptic neuron. Again, first it'll bind AMPA, letting in some sodium, depolarizes the cell. Now the NMDA receptor opens up and that'll let in calcium. Now, normal amounts of calcium are very important. That's how our memory works, okay? That's how our thinking works. That's all good. That's what's supposed to happen. But when there's excessive calcium coming into that cell, you can start to activate secondary pathways that you don't want activated, uh, like calpain, which I think is a great name for an enzyme. Cal as in calcium, pain as in painful. It causes all kinds of problems, okay? So that's what we're getting at. We're, we're seeing with uh, the EMF excessive activation of voltage-gated calcium channels, which are then superimposed on the normal NMDA calcium channel activity to cause chronically elevated intracellular calcium in our neurons of our brain, as well as in cardiac tissue and in uh, uh, reproductive tissue. So it's all not good, okay? And the human body, you know, pretty good at compensating for a lot of things, but you don't want to push your luck, okay? And this kind of relates back like to my theory of What's the most common cause of dementia? Well, one of the most common causes. There's multiple things factoring in towards dementia. And this is what I call the neurovascular uncoupling theory. You've got a baseline metabolic activity in a neuron and you have a baseline oxygen glucose delivery. If you increase the metabolic rate of this neuron, for example, you have some caffeine, you have some MSG stimulants, smoke a cigarette, whatever you want. You're going to increase the metabolic activity of this neuron. So normally the oxygen glucose delivery should be increased to compensate. But there's a lot of things that are bad for that. Caffeine simultaneously is a vasoconstrictor. So it actually drops the blood supply to your like frontal lobes of your brain, your hippoc hippocampus. So you're talking about simultaneous stimulation with vasoconstriction. You have a meal with a pizza, okay? The pizza's got a lot of fat. It's gonna drop oxygen glucose delivery, let's say about 15% on the oxygen delivery. And then you have some sodium, a salt on your pizza is pretty routine. That's a vasoconstrictor. You're dropping this some more. So you can see where this is all going. Then the EMF is activating that neuron some more. You're on some psychiatric pill that's activating this some more. You're widening the gap between the metabolic activity of that neuron and the oxygen glucose delivery being delivered to it. Plus, you got some baseline atherosclerosis from chronic hypertension, chronic diabetes. The wider this gap gets, the more likely these neurons are just going to start dying. And they'll go, typically because it's a gradual process, they'll go into a program cell death called apoptosis. You don't want all this stuff. And that's why I mean by you want to try to do everything right that you can. So maybe if you've got a little gap from things you can't avoid, like the EMF, you, your body can handle small gaps. It can compensate for that. But the wider this gap gets, the more you're just going to start losing neurons. Okay, and you lose some nitric oxide production as you get older. We've also talked previously about the Jack Delatorre theory of chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, you know, which can be due to, you know, again, the baseline atherosclerosis in the brain from hypertension and from diabetes, but also overtreated hypertension, aortic regurg, aortic stenosis, atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, all of those things getting less blood supply to the brain. 
Okay, so this was just my slide saying, you know, what is nitric oxide like? And it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. In general, the good stuff comes from endothelial nitric oxide. It's also called uh, enos number three. And I remember it because there's three things coming out of the side of the letter E for endothelial. And that's how you can remember number three. Now, why do they have numbers on the nitric oxide names? That's because it's in, located in other cells besides just the endothelial cell. Um, so that's why you'll see that. The enos is called number one. The way I remember that is, Letter N is just one thing, and number one is one thing, okay? That'll make sense in a second why I do that. And then I know, Mr. Hyde, is I remember the letter I is like a straight up thing plus a dot on top of it. So there's two parts to the letter I. So you can remember that is NOS2. And the reason why it's worth knowing these if you start studying nitric oxide synthase is because sometimes they're only going to give you the number, okay? All right, and so what I said is there's like this war going on between all the things that are trying to keep you healthy and all the things that are trying to make you sick, okay? And you wanna basically help all the things trying to make you healthy and you wanna avoid all the things trying to make you sick. Because in my experience, most people are much sicker than they realize and they don't take it seriously. You know, I, I've talked, I have, you know, doctors come to me for their personal problems and I'll tell them, well, you shouldn't be drinking fluoridated water anymore. They go, oh, it's too much trouble to fix that. Okay. I tell them you, you shouldn't be uh, doing this other thing they're doing, this other bad happen. They go, well, it's too much trouble to fix that. And I'm like, you want to get better. You know, you can only, let's say, heal two steps a day. If you knock yourself back down two steps, you're never going to climb that hill. You know, and you want to get two steps a day if you can. If you're lucky, you're at least getting one step a day in a positive direction. So you want to maintain it. Okay, so this is just showing the main point. So basically what I'm getting at now is the nitric oxide that we get from our endothelium, from our arterial lining that Dr. Esselstyn and Nathan Bryan talk about, I agree with them, they're correct. That's very good for you. That gives you good blood flow, okay? But the type we're getting from unnecessary activation, primarily of inos, is bad. <clears throat> and you do get um, some activation of, of endnose that you don't want, you know, the neuronal uh, nitric oxide synthase, also from the successive opening of voltage-gated calcium channels and from toxic exposures like toxic chemicals and toxic things in our food and our water, our air, et cetera. Okay. So this is sort of a big summary slide and there's a ton of information on here. And this is a pretty useful one. By the way, if you want to memorize a slide or you want information from a slide, you can just hit the print screen button on your computer and you can save that slide. You can have your own little PowerPoint presentation where you keep it or something for different topics and whatnot. Okay, so, so what I'm basically saying here is most of the time endothelial nitric oxide and neuronal nitric oxide synthase are making nitric oxide for good reasons, most of the time. Um, in biology, there's always subtle nuance here and there, but that's the, the key general point. And in general, INOS is usually activated and our ancestors, let's say, primarily to fight an infection or some other form of related inflammation. And that's for a good purpose. But in the modern world, we're exposed to so many things that unnecessarily activate inos. Another thing to know about enos and endnos is they're constitutive. They're only activated when there's a reason to activate them. They're not always activated. Cytoplasm calcium has to be high. Something has to happen to activate them and they perform a useful job and then they sort of go back to sleep. They only produce tiny like nanomolar amounts of nitric oxide, okay? Whereas inos, inducible nitric oxide, it is different, okay? Inducible nitric oxide is basically turned on by transcription, by synthesizing it from one's DNA. It'll stay on for hours and hours, okay? And it produces micromolar, thousands and thousands of times more nitric oxide than does your typical enos and enos, okay? And that chronically elevated nitric oxide, sometimes there'll also be other things happening whereby your nitric oxide synthase is not fully working as well as it should. And it can undergo something called uncoupling. Uncoupling means that instead of making nitric oxide, it'll make superoxide, which I have drawn right here, O2 minus, which is a free radical of oxygen with an unpaired electron. And the unfortunate thing is that superoxide can combine to make peroxynitrite. O N O O and peroxynitrite is very bad. It's like the devil in your brain. It destroys things and it's almost tries to perpetuate itself. It almost destroys all the things that are supposed to remove it and fix it. So it'll have a tendency to generate what you would call a vicious cycle and beyond going. A lot of disease comes from vicious cycles. And by that, I mean, there's cycles that positively feed back on themselves to keep themselves abnormally elevated. Okay. And peroxynitrite does that in a big way. Okay. Another thing, reason why you, you want to eat a plant-based diet is the folate that you eat 
is used to make something called BH4, tetrahydrobiopterin, which is a cofactor for nitric oxide synthase. So if you're low in, in BH4, your nitric oxide synthase will become uncoupled and start making more superoxide. You don't want that. If you eat a lot real high fat diet, that'll inhibit your, mitro, your uh, mitochondria electron transport chain, and you'll then generate more superoxides, which in the setting of high nitric oxide, they can combine and produce this peroxine nitrite, which you don't want, okay? Nitric oxide has a relatively long half-life. We know it can diffuse from the endothelial cells, it's a gas, into the, the uh, vascular smooth muscle cells around the artery. So it can get around, and if you've got high superoxide anions in your mitochondria, it can react, make peroxine nitrite, peroxine nitrite starts destroying the mitochondria and a few other things. You don't want that, okay? Um, you'll also be producing more hydrogen peroxide, which can go down a similar path, you know, producing hydroxyl radicals, causing lipid peroxidation of the inner mitochondrial membrane, all these bad things, all these oxidative stress things, okay? Okay, but that's kind of the key point. And then, oh, what are some other things that activate? We talk about ischemia, you don't got the ATP to make it, intoxication with alcohol, glyphosate on non-organic food, high fructose corn syrup, which I really think might be due to HD, a common contaminant, high fructose corn syrup, uh, the glycation end products associated with insulin resistance and diabetes, any type of bacteria, you know, leaky gut, you can, you'll get bacteria in your blood, they can be reactivated, especially in the setting of high amounts of free iron. You don't want iron overload. It, 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 it just jumps right in with all these uh, reactive oxygen species and that can run the Fenton reaction, you know, Fe for Fenton, Fe for iron, and that'll produce hydroxyl radicals. And that can also start damaging your mitochondria. You need your mitochondria. If a cell loses too many of its mitochondria, it just says, I don't have enough energy, time to die. Okay, and it goes into apoptosis. So you really don't want that. And the bacteria will, will cause the release of cytokines from your immune cells and they're gonna cause a major ramping up of inducible nitric oxide, okay? So I can remember I for inducible, I for inflammatory nitric oxide, and then most of the things that activate inos, they all start with the letter I, ischemia, injury, like traumatic brain injury, infection, inflammation, um, intoxication. That's kind of how I remember it. Okay, um, and this is just, yeah, going back to the point that there are lots of things elevating your cytoplasm calcium. So you really want to avoid all of the ones that you can avoid. When one of those is minimizing your EMF to the extent that you can. I had a great slide on my bed. I forgot to put my bed in here. I, okay, why am I talking about my bed? Because I, I saw that this was a, a major problem years ago. I didn't understand it then as well as I do now, but I had a cool picture. I, I made a talk about it on my, I forgot to include it, but here's what I did. I took my bed and I put mirrors all around it in every direction because it, to reflect off the EMF. Then what I did was I put them above it to reflect it away. Also, I have all these mirrors and they're all pointing away from the bed to reflect it away from the bed. I have them on the floor, on the ceiling. And then on top of that, I put a Faraday cage over the bed. And of course, people think I'm crazy, but I don't know. I think it works. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, let's see. So I'm sorry I didn't share that picture with you because that's cool. But at least you got the idea. That's one way to shield the EMF. You also can have a switch on your Wi-Fi and just turn it off at night, for example, when you're not using it. And better yet, hardwire everything in your house. And so these mitochondria inhibitors, there's tons of them. They lead to the same effect as an excitotoxin, you know, increase uh, excitatory cytoplasm calcium in your cell. Uh, let's see what else in here. So that's pretty much the big story on that. You can take your, your keyboard and your mouse if they're wireless and get them wired, you know. And I think every little step helps because that's really your goal is to kind of win the game and preserve your health. Uh, but you got to play for these details because they all add up. So here's peroxy nitride inside of a neuron. And I'm just showing you some of the things it does here. So it's the purple. You can see it damaging the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. That's going to lead to elevated cytoplasm calcium. It damages the circa, sarcoplasm endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase. That's going to lead to higher cytoplasm calcium. It damages the mitochondria. That's going to lead to reduced ATP production. Because you can't make the ATP as, as much as you'd like, then you can't run your sodium potassium uh, plasma membrane pumps, which means you can't establish as good a gradient, which means your knockout exchanger is not going to work. All these things lead to chronic increased cytoplasm calcium. So you can see how the cell has to run to stay in the same place and is at very high risk to have its metabolic uh, demands outweigh its oxygen glucose supply, and then it'll just die. You go into apoptosis, okay? Because to me, that's a frightening thing that my internal medicine friends tell me that all of their patients over 60 are mentally slow, okay? It didn't used to be that way. And I got a lot of young people to tell me, my memory's just, I don't think it's as good as it should be. You know, I mean, everybody jokes about old lack of attention spans because people are on these um, 
you know, social media channels where there's immediate gratification and stuff. But I think it's a little more than just a social media channel. I think it's uh, something physiologic in their brains is happening as well. And I'm concerned about that. And, and, and Martin Paul makes the point. He says, look, you got this latency of 30 years in conventional Alzheimer's, but he says in a mouse, you can make it happen real fast. And he believes in people. A lot of people are going to suddenly be demented in their 20s and people are going to be real surprised by it, but it's going to be irreversible. Okay. Okay. So there's tons of papers on showing voltage gated calcium channels are opened up by EMF. And one of the reasons too, you say, well, why isn't there more safety regulation this? And the reason is traditionally people would say, oh, the only effects of EMF are due to heating. You know, and you could, you could put the phone next to, you know, a, a sort of a, a, a mock dummy, if you will, and see if it heats it up. And the point that Martin Paul and the other researchers made, and there's a whole bunch of them, it's not the heating. The heating is not even relevant. What's relevant is opening up these calcium channels. You don't need to heat anything at all. Okay. Okay. Here's another paper by Martin Paul. And, you know, so I give you the papers here. So if you want, you can read more about it on your, on your own. You can watch Martin Paul's videos. There's a couple other people pretty good. Martin Blank did some really good research. I'm going to show you him on here as well. I'm show you some other, other researchers too. But these slides is one that I drew out. I put a lot of detail in there just showing you that, you know, it's like the straws on the camel's back. Reduce all the ones you can because there's going to be some that you just can't get to. And that's part of life, okay? And, and also, don't be doing anything with head trauma, all right? I know a lot of young guys, especially, they're so macho. They want to do kickboxing. They want to do, you know, MMA with sparring. And I say, don't do it. Don't do anything where you get brain time. You don't want anything with brain time. I wrestled. There was no punching in the head, okay? We didn't hit each other's heads. We just wrestled, okay? And that's, I thought, was a good sport. But anything where you get hit in the head, I think, like, soccer is completely stupid. You know, having a kid hit a ball with their head, you know, big coach, grown man kicks a ball and the kids have to head the ball into the goal. That's stupid. That's like a highway to dementia. I've had doctor friends whose kids had to drop out of college for brain damage from, from hitting soccer balls. Okay. Not a smart thing to be doing. And there's other sports too. Football is a ton of fun. I love football. I played tackle football in junior high and I loved it. And it's a lot of fun. And football players are like celebrities in their high schools. I get all that, but man, I don't know. You better think careful about it because you're adding up head trauma, especially when you get in the, in the higher levels. You know, college guys, they're really big and strong. They're like monsters. I lived in a fraternity. All these guys, these college football players, they're like giants. And a lot of them are on roids and they're just huge. Okay, so increased risk of head trauma. All right, so this was just showing, yeah, the head trauma opens up. It induces inducible uh, nitric oxide synthase and um, causes problems. Uh, it'll open up blood-brain barrier permeability. It actually causes leaky gut as well. These things that damage the blood-brain barrier, they also often cause leaky gut. You get a stroke, you'll get increased blood-brain barrier permeability, and you'll get um, leaky gut simultaneously. Plus, if you look at a brain MRI in a normal person when you give IV contrast, there's parts of the brain that light up even in a total normal healthy brain. They lack a blood-brain barrier, like in your pituitary, for example, in the circumventricular organs that are chemosensors around the third ventricle. And so they're getting exposed, okay? And some of that, whatever is in the blood can percolate to adjacent areas. So it's good to assume that there's always a little bit of open blood-brain barrier. So you don't want to expose yourself to toxins, okay? Alcohol, of course, opens up blood-brain barrier, causes brain damage in, in multiple ways, really bad. It's never okay. All the stuff about one or two drinks a day, that's bogus. My advice would be, I, would, I don't wouldn't drink at all, not one drop. Okay, and this was just Martin Paul emphasizing that the thermal concept of safety effects is bogus. It's completely wrong. And the SAR isn't that useful either, the specific absorption rate. Um, okay, so, you know, things everybody knows, a lot of people, they hold the thing right up, touching the side of their ear and their face. And again, you know, one of the things I do is I work as a neuroradiologist. I can tell you, I don't see, hardly ever do I see a global a glioblastoma multiforme. You know, that's the, the primary brain cancer. I hardly ever see that, okay? Uh, what I see all day long, demented, 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 memory loss, can't remember, mental status changes. I see all these old guys, fell, hit head, fell, hit head, fell, hit head. Okay, why is that? Because they're demented. I had a friend who's a neurologist who ran a clinic for falls, okay? And she told me it was kind of a joke. It was kind of a waste of time. She said it was really a dementia clinic, okay? A normal person, when they fall, they put their hands out. You know, they're a little embarrassed, but they're okay. But the demented person, they fall and they hit their heads. All kinds of things happen. All right, so... What I'm trying to say is that's a bad sign. You know, the old person's falling, hitting their head. Uh, more often than not, they're significantly cognitively impaired. Okay, and then we all know about the social thing, people ignoring each other with their phone. They even got uh, lighters on the phone for cigarettes. That's a great combination. Look at this guy, genius. He's got the cell phone touching his head while he's smoking a uh, cigarette. Vasoconstrictor stimulant that increases his hemoglobin as a matocrit, you know, great. 
Okay, and then, you know, the old joke, The Hunchback of Notre Dame was a great book by Victor Hugo. He wrote it when he's only about 29 years old. It was still a masterpiece. I love the book. He didn't have the social depth that he had later with Les Mis, but there's The Hunchback. And The Hunchback was a great guy in the book, and I enjoyed it. I listened to the audiobook because it's so long. Nowadays, Hunchback means something different. It means people staring at their phone. You can walk into a room with young people, and they won't even be talking to her. There'll be five, ten of them, and they're all sitting there staring at their phones. I don't know. I don't like the phone. I was like, if I want to look something up, I look on a computer. Of course, the phone is always with you. You can walk around with it and stuff. A couple of things out there. Look at this young lady here. She's holding her phone right next to her breast. Not a smart move. Uh, women who keep their cell phone in their front pocket, they if they do that for a couple of decades, they get increased incidence of breast cancer in an unusual spot, the inner upper quadrant, for example, versus the usual deodorant cancers, upper outer quadrant. You know, and they shave first and they put the metalloestrogen on there as well as the parabenzoic acid estrogens. Okay, this lady's holding it a little better. Not, I wouldn't hold it too close to my face. You know, you send a text message, you're getting less exposure than if you just, you know, you're talking. You, you never want to hold it to your head unless it's an emergency. Okay, sources of EMF, you know, all these electrical things in general, you want to try to avoid them if you can. Like cordless phones are also bad. The best thing is a plain old telephone that plugs into the wall like you had, you know, in the past, if you're old enough to remember those things. Uh, like I said, try to get rid of the Wi Fi if you can. A young person, man, they're like sterilizing themselves in 10 different ways. They got their cell phone in their front, in their front pocket, cell phone in the front pocket. They got their laptop on their lap. They got Wi-Fi in their house. They got, okay, uh, what else? The power lines. You don't want to live near a power line if you can avoid it. Like when I'm driving, I won't stop underneath the power line. I specifically choose all my routes. I know all the roads and with the places I drive. I don't go too many places. I won't go anywhere where I, I could potentially have to stop my car under a power line. I won't do it. And it's not that bad, but I, you know, I'm kind of obsessive compulsive and stuff. And I, I think that's good, you know. I can assure you my wife finds it annoying, but I think it's good. Uh, let's see, what else? Dimmer switches, they increase what's called dirty electricity. Fluorescent bulbs uh, increase the amount of EMF given off. Incandescents are better. They're harder to find nowadays. LEDs kind of give a bluish light, which is a little bit of a decreaser of melatonin. Um, microwaves, I think, are bad. I wouldn't even have a microwave. I'd get it out of your house. I used to have an EMF tester and that was giving off a lot of EMF, even when it wasn't on. Okay. And be careful that you don't have like the microwave here and then the wall and then like somebody right next to the, to it on the other side of the wall. You know, that's a bad idea. I don't like hair dryers. I don't got much hair, but I don't like hair dryers. I would never use them. Uh, I tell my kids not to use them, but you know, people don't listen to me as much as I think they should. Um, so anyways, those are some of the things we'll come back to that. All I'm saying is, all of this modernism, in my opinion, it's like the highway to hell. It's destroying people's health. You know, people always think, oh, progress is inevitable. Everything's getting better. I don't think so. I see massive deterioration in people. I think people are less healthy than they used to be uh, mentally and physically. Okay. And a lot of it, they're just doing it to themselves out of ignorance. Okay. And then people say, well, you know, is this just Martin Paul? Is he some crazy guy? Those few other researchers you meant? No. The mobile phone insurance companies don't want to insure the cell phone companies. They know that there are health problems associated with these things, so they won't in um, they won't they won't supply insurance for the uh, cell phone wireless associated problems. So that's telling you something, okay? If if it was really safe, the insurance companies say, "Oh, sure, we'll insure that, no big deal." You know, they're going to make money. No, they know this is dangerous stuff. I'm actually quite worried about it. You can't. You can't easily avoid it. And I don't like cell phones, as a matter of fact. I think they make people stupid. And I don't even own a cell phone anymore because I don't have to. The way my, my job works now, I don't have to have one. I can, I have workarounds on the rare event when I get an out-of-house call. And I think they make people stupid. I'll tell you, like my daughter, when she's in seventh and eighth grade, she would read a book and she would talk to me. We'd have all these nice conversations. Her mother insisted on buying her cell phone. I said, no, they, when they're at their friend's house, they can call it their friend's phone. But anyways... She got a phone. She like never discussed the book with me ever again. Okay. She's a grown up now. Um, and I see that what happens is then they, all they care about is her little social world. Um, and it's part of it feeds into this whole attention span thing too. I walk around people and I'll see these people who I used to talk to. And now they just sit there staring at their phones. Um, it tracks you everywhere. It surveils you everywhere. Um, besides it opens up the blood brain barrier. Besides opening up voltage gated calcium channels, it also opens up blood brain barrier. Those are both bad. It increases cancer. It, uh, it's not just a cell phone. It's the whole Wi-Fi society. This could all be hardware. This could all be fiber optics. I think it's bad. And there's authors like Martin Blank and others, they believe that it is contributing to a massive decline in the bird populations, disrupting their ability to navigate by the Earth's magnetic field. 
They believe that it's also contributing to the uh, colony collapse of the bees. Now, some of that can also be herbicides and pesticides. I don't know exactly how much you contribute to one or the other, but it's not good for the environment. And then the thought that we could replace this with fiber optics and hardwired devices, we don't have to have it. To me, the whole thing sounds ridiculous. I think it's you know typical society. Everybody just goes along and acts like it's some wonderful thing. I don't. I think it's stupid. I don't like cell phones. I hate cell phones. Okay, and it's creating like this electronic concentration. You know what? I think it's bad. One ring to rule them all. It's like everything is centralized. And I think all these mom and pop places are going out of business. I don't think that's good. And it reminds me of the song we used to listen in wrestling practice. We were doing front headlocks, front body locks. And I used to play the song Stranglehold. And it's like, that's what I think the public's in with this total electronic control of everything and centralization. I don't think it's good. That's my opinion. Okay, this slide got a little messed up. We already showed it though in, in another one. Okay, so what does this come from here about what's called the potassium to sodium ratio? You want your potassium about five times higher than your sodium, which if you're eating processed food and meat, that's a little bit difficult to achieve because potassium is a vasodilator, sodium is a vasoconstrictor. But if you're eating a plant-based diet, it's easy to be like 20 times higher, so you don't have to worry about it. But just so you know, the concept of K factor, the ratio of potassium to sodium, as promoted by Richard Moore, MD, PhD, in his book, High Blood Pressure Solution. It's the best explanation ever, hypertension, if, you, if you're interested in that subject. And he explains how a lot of populations that are hypertensive, it's not even because they're salt sensitive. It's just because they don't eat any potassium because they don't eat any plants. Okay, um, kind of covered that already. Oh, here's another book that's quite good. This is one is by Martin Blank. And he's the guy who showed that the the chemical structure of DNA is such that it's what's called a fractal antenna. Um, and it, it, it absorbs EMF to it. It, it, it. It's very vulnerable to EMF effects just because of its structure. Um, another guy, uh, Sam Milham, did some great work on ele dirty electricity. And he said that good science does not change policy. Only citizens can do that. So it's pretty much impossible to educate large amounts of the American public. But that's what it would take for any rules to change. Now, that lady who gave the previous talk on EMF, Theodora Scarato, said in some some countries, they were motivated enough to try to remove Wi-Fi from the schools and to educate people more about how to avoid it. But it's almost like there's so much inertia in the United States, it's hard to motivate anything to happen. About all you can do is sort of just change your own personal behavior. Um, and I think that's probably the best you could do. Um, another, here's a nice quote by Michael Merzenich. He's one of the co-inventors of the cochlear implant. He said, if you want to improve a brain, you train it. Like, let's say you want to be a great musician. You train yourself, let's say, to play piano. You play piano a lot every day and you get better and better. And then he said, if you want a lower performance of a brain, what you do is you introduce noise. Okay, so to introduce noise would be distractions of any kind, you know, uh, beat music playing around there, strobe light flashing, your email going blinking, bing, bing, bing. Um, and also EMF in your brain, opening up uh, voltage-gated calcium channels unnecessarily. So you want to minimize all the things that make it harder for you. To, for example, I'll show you a trick I learned for studying. When I study, you can't turn your ears off. I'll wear earplugs. Okay, that way I don't hear anything and all the noise being made around my house. And I looked at all the memory champers, like the world champions of memory, and they would wear those things. And I know it helps. You get a little more intellectual bandwidth to do what you're doing. So I've also seen that I've been around some pretty smart people and some pretty talented athletes. I've seen guys who are world champion athletes and they live like Spartans, really simple, entirely simple. And the reason is they're focusing all their energy on what they want to become great at, either some scientific task or uh, some athletic task, and that improves their performance. So what I'm saying is modern human, we're kind of distracted all over the place to some extent in comparison. And this EMF contributes to that as well as all the, the, the stuff in the processed food, in the air, and the water, and it's degrading human performance, okay? And so the reason you'd want to do these things is if you care about your own personal performance, you want to avoid the noise, so to speak. Um, just a couple of abbreviations here. There's LOAD, is late onset Alzheimer's disease. And that's what the vast majority of dementia is. I, would, I don't even really like the word Alzheimer's. I've talked about that in previous lectures, but just say dementia. And again, the what they're talking about is early onset uh, dementia would typically be some type of genetic predisposition. Okay. But now they have a new word calling very early onset dementia. And they believe that there's that there's more and more of this. And they think that the EMF is a contributor to that. Martin Paul is the biggest uh, spokesperson in the scientific community talking about that. And it's a real concern. 
Okay. <clears throat> you can use your AM radio as an EMF sensor. All you do is turn it all the way to the end of the spectrum where you don't have a channel and then just walk around your house and where you hear more static and the louder the static, the stronger the EMF in that area. Sort of a cheap way to quickly, quickly test things. There are things like tri-field meters you could buy to test stuff. I was real interested in testing all these things you know, many, many years ago when I first got married, had kids and a new house and I wanted to test everything everywhere, make sure we put the kids' bedrooms in the best spot and avoid everything. I tested all the different routes that I would drive to my job, which ones had different EMFs coming off the power lines that I have to go under, make sure I don't have to stay under any power lines, that I don't have to sit parked at a red light by a bunch of cell phone towers. Anyways, I figured it all out and figured out the best routes. Okay. So I was into it at that time, but then, you know, that was many years ago. I lost the, the darn thing since then, but um, that's one thing you could do if you're interested in that. Okay, this was just uh, getting back now. We're talking about the DNA antenna concept that Martin Blank sort of pioneered. Like when you listen to a Bach fugue, it has an element of self-symmetry repeating itself with a slightly different nuance, just like the art of Moritz Escher. It repeats itself, and that's also called a fractal, uh, and there's self-symmetry, but it also changes gradually. And anyways, DNA structure of the double helix is very much like that. And unfortunately, it just has a tendency to be very sensitive to EMF effects and you'll often see DNA breakages, okay? And they can test that with something called the comet tail assay, all right? And uh, Martin Blank and uh, Reba Goodman, they did a lot of work on this, and he wrote a book about it. It's a good book. I, I enjoyed reading the book. Okay, here is uh, this guy right here is in, in the upper corner here is Henry Lai, and he figured this out a long time. And I thought that was kind of funny is that his name is Dr. Lai. That's kind of a funny name for a scientist, but Dr. Lai is telling the truth. And he showed repeatedly, and it's been repeated by others, that this EMF of, you know, in the range of conventional exposures causes DNA uh, breakages, all right? And then there was another guy down here by the name of George Carlo. He also showed that there was damages to the cells causing something called micronuclei, which is thought to be a significant predisposition to cancer. So what happens to all these guys is first they try to discredit them, then they take their funding away. And so what I'm saying is this is a widespread problem in science. When somebody's doing really good, useful research, if you say something that the big corporations don't want, your funding gets taken away, they call the university, they try to get the scientists fired. Um, it's unfortunate. So in our society, I can assure you, this happens all the time. Good scientists, good doctors, they try to help the public and they get fired. Industry's got the big money. So if the scientist or the doctor doesn't do what the big industry wants, they get either discredited or fired, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why you have to kind of be careful. Like when you read the scientific literature, you can't just say, well, the paper says this is good. If industry funds that paper, it's probably a bogus paper. And industry's got the money. They will buy the journal. They will buy the scientists. They buy the research. And then what they'll do is they'll publish 10 papers all saying the thing that they sell is good for you. And then what'll happen is you'll say, well, what about these other papers? You know, I've got three papers showing this thing is, is causes problems. And then industry will say, look, there's 10 papers out number three papers. Therefore, the weight of the evidence is on the side of the commercial product. But usually the best papers are the ones that were done a long time ago when there was no commercial bias involved. Um, so all of that's important because it takes some intellectual thinking to read scientific literature and come up with useful conclusions. And, you know, you look at secondary gain. Are they trying to sell you something? Do they have something else that they gain from doing that? Is that where they get their funding from, et cetera? Okay, this is just another brief summary. And this is what I meant by NNOS, you know, neuronal nitric oxide synthesis is number one. There's one little stroke of writing to make the letter N. ENOS, there's three things coming off the side of the E. So it's NOS3. INOS, there's two things. There's a dot and then there's the, the vertical stalk. So you can remember that as two parts and that's INOS number two, okay? That's how I remember them. That works. All right. So nitric oxide has got a little bit of a long half-life. We said it can diffuse into other locations and, and react in other spots. And something similar also happens with hydrogen peroxide. It has a little bit of a half-life. It can move around from one cellular compartment to another versus hydroxyl radical. It reacts immediately with whatever it contacts. Okay. Okay. Here's the mitochondria. You've got the outer mitochondrial membrane, which sort of separates it from the cytoplasm. Then you've got the intermembranous space. And then you've got the inner mitochondrial membrane. That's where electron transport is. Then in the center, you've got the mitochondrial matrix, okay? What happens in the mitochondria is it takes electrons uh, that have been you know, taken off of glucose, for example, or off of fats, and it will pass them down this electron transport chain from weakly 
um, electronegative, mean weak grabbers of electrons to strong grabbers of electron like oxygen. Oxygen is the ultimate electron acceptor. It really wants to grab um, electrons. It's got a very high electronegativity, desire to grab electrons. It's next only to fluoride for its desire to grab electrons, okay? So it's the ultimate electron acceptor. And when it accepts that electron, it gets converted into water, H2O. Meanwhile, these pumps here in the, in the inner mitochondrial membrane, they're pumping hydrogen protons into the intermembranous space. And they built up a gradient. It's a very powerful gradient. It's the highest gradient in the human body that I'm aware of, like negative 160 millivolts. And then it's almost like pressurized air, if you will. Then at the end of that, at complex five, they will allow a hydrogen proton to come back down into the matrix of the mitochondria. And it's like a water wheel effect. And that will spin ATP synthase and it'll produce an ATP. That's how mitochondria make energy. That's how most energy is made in the human body. Okay, once in a while, you'll get some, you know, this is normal. You get a little bit of uh, oxygen, you know, falling off the electron transport chain. Well, I'm sorry, you'll get, a, you'll get an electron that falls off the uh, electron transport chain and it combines with oxygen to make superoxide. That's a free radical. And the cells are usually pretty good at cleaning that up. They got superoxide dismutase, SOD, converts it into water pretty fast. So they can handle it in normal routine, small amounts. But when you've got mitochondrial inhibitors from toxic chemical exposures and from excessive dietary fat ingestion, especially saturated fat, you can start making too much of this uh, superoxide here. And when you get too much superoxide, you'll start more and more combining it with nitric oxide and then producing down here in this lower left corner, uh, peroxynitrite, O-N-O-O, -O -O, okay? And that's a problem because that can quickly lead to uh, other free radicals being produced like hydroxyl radicals and destruction of the inner mitochondrial membrane. So destruction of a membrane is typically called lipid peroxidation. Um, and if you got free iron in the mitochondrial matrix as well here, you can run the Fenton reaction. Again, Fe for iron, ferrous is like the Latin word for rust, and Fe for Fenton. And that also takes the hydrogen peroxide and will convert it into free radicals like uh, hydroxyl radicals. You've got catalase is a the enzyme as well as glutathione peroxidase that can deactivate the hydrogen peroxidase, the hydrogen peroxide, but you basically, you don't want too many superoxide anions. So you don't want mitochondria inhibitors. Uh, so you don't end up with all these problems. Here was just one of the slides where, that I got from studying mitochondria inhibitors. I was, cause I know mitochondria inhibition was a big problem. So I became curious about it. I went to all the books and they had nothing. Those books are a joke. They're basically designed to not teach people how to take care of patients. Right, just to sell drugs. Okay, so I started looking at look at this atrazine right here, inhibiting complex three. Well, that's what's sprayed on almost all the corn, the non-organic corn. Okay, and that's also a very powerful um, estrogenic chemical. All right, super common. That's one thing I wouldn't eat anything sweetened with non-organic uh, corn. All right, Tylenol. Lots of people take Tylenol. Okay, I got doctor friends who take Tylenol and they don't want to stop taking Tylenol. It's a mitochondria inhibitor. I would never take it. Okay, I realize there might be some special stuff with a kid, maybe in a special circumstance, fine with a fever that the pediatrician tells you. Okay, fine. I'm just telling you it's a mitochondria inhibitor. Okay, statins, coenzyme Q, they decrease its function. All right. Um, metformin, okay, is decreasing complex one. I've had doctors come up to me, do you think I should take metformin? It'll improve my age. And I'm like, man, you do whatever you want. I wouldn't mess around. I would be low fat, low sodium, vegan exercise, get your sleep, manage your stress, et cetera. Why you always go looking for the easy way when most of the time the easy way is, is a fake. It doesn't work. It's just taking your money. Okay, PCBs are common. Trichloroethylene from dry cleaning. What I'm showing you is there's about 45 uh, mitochondria inhibitors here, and many of these things are common. Okay, a lot of times people like go for a procedure and they want sedation. Okay, I don't, I don't want sedation. First of all, I try not to have to go for a procedure, but if I had to go, I'd try to do whatever I could without sedation. I don't want these drugs potentially affecting my memory like your benzodiazepines. I don't want any of that stuff. Even propofol right here is an inhibitor of complex two. These antifungals, which are typical preservatives, I'm now looking at inhibition of complex two, typical preservatives in all kinds of processed foods. Um, and sometimes also, of course, in personal care products, mitochondria inhibitors. And a lot of them are also um, estrogenic. Okay. You don't want that. Look at here. BPA over here is damaging to the mitochondrial, inner mitochondrial membrane. That's the bisphenol A. And there's all the bisphenol A equivalents, essentially. They're probably also toxic to your mitochondria. And again, these are really common things. Omega-6 cooking oils get uh, converted into hydroxynanol, toxic aldehyde. That's like the research of Tetsumori Yamashima, why he thinks most the incidence of Japanese uh, people becoming demented has increased so much. He thinks that's a major contributor. F- minus, of course, is, is toxic to complex four here. <clears throat> Multiple food dyes are toxic to mitochondria. Um, 
a lot of these antibiotics like the fluoroquinolones, aminoglycosides can be toxic to the uh, mitochondria. So I'm showing you that there's a lot of things that are harmful to mitochondria, okay? Excessive iron, most men start becoming iron overloaded after 20 women after their postmenopausal, and then they'll gradually be at risk to have more and more free iron available. And iron's like a fire. You want it in your stove to cook food. You want it in your fireplace to warm your house, but you don't want it anywhere else because it causes problems. That's what it does inside cells. And it'll react very rapidly, you know, like with your superoxide. So I'm just showing you some of this you probably have going on and you might not be able to prevent it, but prevent what you can um, to keep yourself sort of healthy. Oh, my mouse is kind of going there. Okay, sorry about that. All right, it's hard for me to see my mouse. I can't really even see it. All right, well, this is just showing you a little bit more of, you know, what this is all about, getting the calcium pumped out of the cytoplasm so the cell can get the rest that it needs. Okay, does EMF cause psychiatric symptoms? This article I thought was a little bit funny. This was written by like psychiatrists in the Biological Psychiatry Journal saying that if they just set the dose right, they think they can get a small therapeutic effect to improve mood, which is funny because people are exposed to tons of EMF and it's impossible to control the dose. So the only significance I see of that article is that it's an indicator of a biological effect being caused by the EMF. Versus then you look like Martin Paul's article and he went through all these papers. This guy is like a marathon, intellectual marathon runner. He goes through thousands of papers and he just cataloged all these types of psychiatric things that were associated with EMF, insomnia, which would totally make sense to me and anxiety and decreased attention because you're creating increased noise in your cerebral cortex, in your hippocampus. You're going to have, you be agitated, anxious. You're going to be less able to sleep going to be less able to concentrate. You add noise, you degrade brain performance. And eventually, if you start having your good neurons in your hippocampus, for example, going into apoptosis, you're going to have impaired memory. Okay. And it can also, you know, cause depression in some way too. Now, I don't know exactly what that means. Does that mean more brain cells are damaged or could have some other effect? And we know also food can have similar effects. Some of these food dyes are associated with these types of mood changes. <clears throat> Plus your brain is going to be suboptimally performing when it's exposed to high fat, high sodium. It's not going to get as much oxygen and glucose as it's expecting to get. Okay. Oh, they even have a name for this called microwave syndrome due to uh, harmful effects upon the brain due to excessive exposure to microwaves and the subsequent EMF electromagnetic field they induce. So here's a catalog of all the different things he, saw, he found associated. So we talked about headaches from blood brain, Gary, blood brain barrier being opened up. And so you're leaking, you know, toxic chemicals, including just albumin and fibrinogen, which are normal. Plus who knows what else is in your blood after you eat a meal. Um, depression, let's see, anything else in there? We talk about concentration problems. Because yeah, there's young people and I've heard young people talking about <clears throat> their memory. They don't think it's as good as it should be. They just have a hard time concentrating. And we talk about all these kids in the schools with attention deficit. And now that came along be well before the cell phones. Back in the 1970s, there was a guy by the name of Dr. Feingold. He was an allergist and he had a Feingold diet. And that was shown to be pretty helpful for uh, children who were hyperactive. Not to mention just, you know, any kid, like a boy, you know, they're, when they're in grade school age, they're not made to sit in a chair eight hours a day, listening to some lady they don't know, talking about things they don't care about. Okay. So then on top of it, now they're exposed to EMF, et cetera, uh, with the Wi-Fi and all that in the schools, you know, that's not good. Okay. Um, effective cell phone usage on men's lowering their sperm counts, lowering their sperm motility, more abnormal sperm. Um, and the male gonads, they got lots of voltage gated calcium channels. The ovaries of a woman are a little deeper inside her body, but they're also vulnerable to injury from this, uh, EMF exposure. And of course, cell phone in the pocket in the front pocket is complete stupidity. Um, this is just showing increased incidence of, um, miscarriages in women. And I've known women neurologists who worked, um, near really powerful MRI magnets, like these research magnets. And a lot of them had all kinds of problems with their uh, pregnancies and deliveries, they were telling me. Okay, let's see. Increase inos after transient occlusion. Oh, well, that's just showing ischemia. Well, we know ischemia can do it because when you have ischemia, lack of blood supply means lack of oxygen, then you're not going to be able to make as much ATP. You can't make as much ATP. You're going to drop the function of your sodium potassium ATP as pumps, thus your plasma membrane, electrochemical gradients with the sodium in particular, and you can't run your NACA exchanger, you get higher cytoplasmic calcium, okay? Um, and there's a typical thing when I see a demented brain. This is what I usually see. I just see an atrophic old brain, okay? Eh, sometimes I'll see a bunch of small strokes, a bunch of silent strokes, but most of the time it's not too much of that. That's not the explanatory problem. And it's just an atrophic brain, a shrunken brain from chronic apoptosis, chronic loss of brain cells that just are progressively, can't meet my oxygen glucose delivery, time to die, time to die, time to die. 
okay, this is just my theory before that, you know, it's that combination of where your metabolic rate is relative to your oxygen glucose delivery and the toxins make it worse, whereas the antioxidants and the good blood supply help protect you. Okay, a little bit about oxidative stress. And then how are we doing for time here? How are we doing for time? You have about another 45 minutes, if you like it. Oh, Oh God, I can, yeah, I got, usually I, I usually have too much, but I think I got some more here, but, um, and we'll have time and, for and questions. There's a, there's a couple of questions in the chat when you have time and, and one question was submitted in advance. Okay. Um, so basically again, you know, what is an oxidant? It's just something that steals an electron. Okay. And that explains a lot of pathology. A lot of the things that are so-called toxins are things that go around stealing electrons. Um, an antioxidant is something that donates an electron and it can sort of neutralize that effect. And again, the antioxidant will have multiple double bonds and it'll be a relatively big molecule. So handing off an electron is no big deal for it. It can delocalize the charge and remain stable itself and not be hyperreactive. Okay, uh, free radical means unpaired electron in the outer orbital. Reactive oxygen species is because some of these molecules in these pathways are not necessarily free radicals, but they still have a strong influence on uh, pathology. Um, and the main categories are ROS, reactive oxygen species, and RNS, reactive nitrogen species. Um, let's see here. We covered these enough. Okay, a little bit about these channels. The AMPA right here is just the uh, sodium channel for binding glutamate. Glutamate, by the way, about 80% of your brain neurotransmitters are glutamate. Okay, so it's the most important neurotransmitter in the brain. And it'll typically react first with the AMPA, let some sodium into the cell, depolarize the postsynaptic neuron. And then the NMDA is like a coincident detector. It has to bind glutamate. It actually has to bind glycine and serine as well. And then once that postsynaptic cell is depolarized, then the magnesium will pop out of its center, which will allow calcium to pass through it. And that's why NMDA, because they can be graded um, so precisely, they are really important for memory, for forming memories you know, like long-term potentiation, for example. Okay, there's other things like beta amyloid protein. We're not going to get into all this beta amyloid protein stuff. There are some interesting things about it, but beta amyloid protein and phosphorylated tau proteins, they come into play with dementia and so-called Alzheimer's dementia relatively late in the game. And that's why they're not my uh, favorite dementia theories. I think they're relatively late actors and they're, they're relevant but they're not the main thing. The main thing you want to know with disease is what begins it, what starts the ball rolling in a negative direction, and can you reverse that? That's the most important thing to know about any disease. Okay. Um, oh, this is just one article about volatile organic compounds, how they can have toxic effects and lead to increased cytoplasm calcium, lead to increased induction of inos, you know, inducible nitric oxide synthase. And, and the reason I show you this is a lot of people work with toxic chemicals. If you have to do it for your job or something, open the door, okay? Put a fan to blow the stuff out of the way. Just don't unnecessarily expose yourself if you could avoid it. You know, you don't want to just be like a cow in the rain, you know, make, optimize your environment, use your brain. Because I see people who, who make themselves sick from that sort of ignorance, you know? Okay, things associated with decreasing circa. Just to keep it simple, I've given previous lectures on circa, sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. Anything that smells bad is probably bad for you. Anything sort of processed, you know, with a bunch of preservatives in it and food dyes, it's bad for you. Just assume that it is, okay? Yeah, and that's like people will say to me when there's like some type of social event, you know, why don't I have some junk food or, you know, pizza or all this stuff? And they go, don't you want to enjoy life? And I'm like, you know what? I don't think being, you know, fat, sick, and stupid is going to make me enjoy life anymore. I don't say that, of course, but that's kind of what I'm thinking when they push too hard to try to push junk food on me. Um, let's see. I look at it like, you know, cigarettes or alcohol. No, I don't want any of that stuff. I want to try to keep my brain good as long as I can. Um, I saw all these authors who, I saw some authors like Victor Hugo who remain, who retained greatness all the way up into his late years. Um, in his late 70s and whatnot. And then I see the other authors, they just lose it by the time they hit their 60s. They're no longer sharp. They're no longer funny. And I'm like, I don't want that to happen to me. I'm, I want to try to keep mentally sharp and good as best I can. I'm 60, by the way. I think I'm doing pretty good, okay? Um, oh, by the way, the other thing too, I'm going to brag here. I did 75 push-ups on Saturday in a row. And I don't, I eat super low protein because everyone says, oh, you need high protein or you're going to be sarcopenic, you're going to be weak. And I got all these young bodybuilder friends of mine and they're all taking supplements and protein supplements and all this crap. And I just said, no, you don't need to do that. Just stop putting your cell phone in your front pocket and microwaving your balls 
you know, and lift with a little more intensity, you'll get stronger. You don't need to do that. Okay. Um, let's see what else here. You know, that in a buck 50, you'll get your ride on a bus, but it makes me happy. You know, when you, you, know, you get older in life, a lot of things are sad, you know, so you need to have some things that make you happy to counteract the sadness. That's part of life. And you also, you want to do something good, whatever it is, sort of counteract the negatives in life. That's how you balance it out. Okay. So anyways, these are a whole bunch of things. Some of these estrogenic chemicals are also circa inhibitors. Um, problems associated with decreased circle levels. Well, they cause kind of health problems all over the place, but for today, we're just emphasizing the brain effects because that's, I think, most relevant. Okay, what else increases circa? It's pretty much the same stuff all makes you healthy. We talked about these things before. Get your sunshine, get your exercise, manage your stress, maintain your social relationships, whatever else gives you a sense of purpose in life. Maybe it's religion for you. All of those things improve your health. Watch out for these things that cause vicious cycles because you know, you have to break that cycle. So stop introducing the problem, you know, stop introducing the junk food, the processed food, the alcohol, the tobacco, um, minimize your EMF, and then your body's natural healing uh, can take its place. You know, the body wants to get better. This is just a quick summary of some of the different vicious cycles. So usually it's the person repeatedly exposing themselves to something. Sometimes you can't completely avoid it. You know, there's air pollution and you can't move, you know, do the best you can with it. Um, and I guess this EMF is like electro pollution, if you will. Okay. This is even just showing there's a lot of little mechanisms, especially that, uh, peroxy nitrite, O N O O it's really tricky. It basically goes around and destroys everything that would minimize its amount. So it just keeps drifting upward. It's it's, and that's another reason why you want to stop things before they become like that. Start heading into irreversibility. Okay. This was just another picture of peroxy nitrite going around, destroying the plasma membrane, calcium ATPase, destroying the circa, you know, destroying the mitochondria, all the things to lower cytoplasm calcium. So thus it kind of keeps its own levels high until it destroys the cell, kills the cell. Okay, what was this? Um, oh, this is just some papers, you know, doing what I just said uh, peroxy nitrite does. And there's lots of papers. Like I said, there's Martin, pa Martin Paul, he went through thousands of papers. Okay. His book is a really dense book. Okay. I usually blow through paperbacks in a week. Okay. It took me two weeks to read his book. Um, there was so much detailed, you know, going through papers like this. And, and so that's what it all comes down to is you want to avoid those things. Cause you get this pathway going of increased inducible nitric oxide synthase, increased chronic positive feedback, vicious cycle loops of elevated cytoplasm calcium. Your brain cells are going to get destroyed by that. Okay, and I worry about that effect on, you know, the kids' schools, okay? Being exposed to all that Wi-Fi from a young age while they're more fragile. Kids are more fragile because they have a thinner skull, so the, the EMF effects penetrate deeper into their brain. Their brain's also less myelinated. It's got more water in it, and that actually leads to the EMF having a worse effect. Plus, their neurons are developing. They're not as established yet, so they're, they're more vulnerable in all these different ways, okay? Oh, here was something interesting showing that fiber helps protect the blood-brain barrier. We've talked about this before. When you eat the fiber, it goes down into your gut. The bacteria convert it into short chain fatty acids, two carbon acetate, three carbon propionate, four carbon butyrate, especially the butyrate is used to make tight junctions in your gut lining cells, your enterocytes, colonocytes, all right, enteric uh, lining cells, epithelial cells. Anyways, the point is they actually do the same thing in the brain. So eating that dietary fiber helps you to maintain your blood brain barrier, which I thought was, you know, was great news. And another thing too is one of the reasons like, why does this keep coming up? It's because- I actually think that the low-fat vegan diet is a species-specific diet to make humans healthy. You go to the zoo, the zookeeper knows this is what you feed, you know, the lions and tigers and bears and monkeys and everything else, because it's his job to keep that animal alive and to uh, keep it healthy, okay? And what I'm saying for humans, that's the diet that keeps us alive and healthy. And it has so many effects because we're designed to eat that way that it helps prevent these problems as much as they can be prevented. So here's just another paper showing that blood-brain barrier is protected by short-chain fatty acids. And they say microbiota derived short-chain fatty acids, which I think is funny. It probably helps them get the article published. If they said vegan diet derived short-chain fatty acids, they might not publish that. But you say, oh, microbiota derived. Oh, yes, we must give them a probiotic. You know, it's all BS. You just eat the fire, eat the plant food. Okay, animal foods don't have any fiber. I got this slide from this uh, guy who's like a nutrition expert from India, Gurmeet Singh Mangu. And you're like, there's no fiber in animal foods. There's no fiber in um, oil and in sugar, okay? Uh, so you're not gonna get it from processed food. You're not gonna get it from meat. You're not gonna get it from oil, okay? Just eat the plant food, eat your greens. You know, you get a lot of good things from greens. People think, oh, the salad is so boring, but that's got a lot of your nitrates to produce the good type of nitric oxide, endothelial nitric oxide, opening up your arteries. Um, 
And it's got a lot of other nutrients, even ones we don't even know their names. And it's got a lot of fiber. Okay, so what else can we do? Oh, there's something called the inverse square rule. And what's that all about? So what that means is, let's say I'm standing right here about two feet away from this computer. You get one over the inverse square. So one over two squared is one over four, one fourth. And then I move four feet back. Then I get one over four squared, which is one over 16. So one sixteenth versus one fourth of the dose. You get a dramatic reduction in dose by moving just a small distance away. So increase your distance, hold your phone away from you. Don't be sitting next to your, your, your Wi-Fi router if you have to have one. And, um, you know, avoid it to the extent you can. Don't buy a house near a power line or a cell tower. Um, shield things as you can. Like I told you about my crazy bed that I get made fun of, but I don't care. I was like, go ahead and make fun of me. Okay, we'll see who has better concentration in the future. Um, <clears throat> I surrounded it with mirrors that all face away. It almost looked like one of those dancing studios, you know, like the ballerinas. They put their leg up on the bar, look at themselves in the mirror. Um I have all those facing away from my bed, including on the floor, the ceiling, and a Faraday cage around my bed. All right. And I did that many years ago because I, I, I knew this was a problem many years ago. I, I hadn't gone through all the details with the no oh no pathway of Martin Paul, but I read a whole bunch of other stuff about it. Okay. Uh, so shielding, turn off the Wi-Fi at night. Let's see what else. Avoid fluorescence and dimmer switches. Avoid hair dryers, heated water beds, electric blankets. So avoid any unnecessary electrical stuff if you can. Ideally, your bedroom should be a sanctuary. I've even heard experts saying you should change your alarm clock to battery operated. You know, you want like as little to no electricity in your bedroom as you can, because you spend a lot of time in your bed sleeping at night. And again, your body, the way I think of it is look at these like video games, Super Mario Brothers or something. The little character runs around, some bad things happen to him and he loses energy points. And then he catches some good things and he gains an energy points. And the human body is kind of like that. So you don't want to waste your healing energy just dealing with stuff that you could have avoided. So you want to save that healing energy to protect you from other diseases or other problems that are not so easy to avoid. That's actually, I think, a good way to think about health. Okay. And I can also tell you, doctors don't know these things because, you know, I know lots of doctors. I talk to a whole bunch of doctors every day and I know exactly what they know and what they don't know. Doctors are basically trained in internal medicine. Medical school is preparation to become an internal medicine doctor. And all the books say, don't know what causes this disease, partly genetic, multifactorial, Let's give him a pill. Maybe we could slow it down. That's what that's like almost every single chapter. You don't even have to know the disease. Just say any common disease. That's probably what the book says. There's some exceptions to that, but that's probably what it says. So they're not going to know all these concepts. And these things about a threshold, last straw broke the camel back. Don't add any straws to the camel's back. These are useful concepts. Um, like I said, I wish I'd known all these things before. I would have never been fat in my 30s and I would have been able to keep my parents alive a lot longer. Okay, what else? Um, don't give kids a cell phone if you can avoid it. Um, we talked about Wi-Fi could easily be changed to hardwired in your house to fiber optics in a more extensive way. Oh, I even heard you should change your eyeglasses from metal to plastic that then the metal springs in your bed mattress can have an effect to increase the EMF around you. And the metal uh, frames on your eyeglasses apparently increase the amount of EMF attracted towards your head. So yeah, I mostly wear my glasses for driving. I don't really need them other than for driving, you know? Okay, uh, let's see, what else? Um, you don't want things near the big electronic appliance, especially if it's on the you know other side of the wall, avoid that. Don't put the baby's bed near that stuff. Um, and don't smell up the kid's room. Some people are having a baby and they paint the room and they, they varnish the drywall on the floor. No, 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 the baby doesn't wanna be inhaling all those chemicals, potential circa inhibitors, okay? I knew some lady or kid got, she thinks chronic fatigue from that sort of thing. Um, that's that book, Calcium Connection by Brenda Brody. I thought that was a good story. Okay, no Wi-Fi in the schools. That's a bad idea. Um, knowing what I know now, I wouldn't want my kid going to school with Wi-Fi. And I realize a lot of them have it. But see what you can do about that. Uh, you know, all these electronic monitors, all this electronic stuff, we're not really made for it. You know, humans, we're not. We try to pretend it's no big deal. Well, it is. Okay, what? We talked about AM radio, cheap meter. Potentially buy yourself one of those tri-field meters to measure the stuff around your house if you want. Um, don't stand next to electrical boxes. Like if you're in a lunchroom where you eat at your job, you have a little tiny spot to eat. Don't sit with your back right next to the electrical box transformer, okay? The closer you are to it, remember the inverse square rule, you minimize your exposure by being farther away from it. So or go eat in a different room. Okay, what else to prevent? Stuff we already pretty much talked about. And like I said, too, I try to avoid all these mitochondrial inhibitors and circa inhibitors because in the end, the net effect of a mitochondrial inhibitor or a circa inhibitor is they all end up being like an excitotoxin, elevating cytoplasm, calcium, 
and then leading to all the secondary effects, excitotoxicity, overactivation of a neuron with potential risk of neurovascular uncoupling and subsequent neuronal death or neuronal dysfunction. So you want to avoid that stuff. Okay. And what am I recommending? I'm saying you want to try to live like Adam and Eve, but keep your indoor heating, indoor plumbing. I love those things, but be kind of simple. I can tell you the greatest achievers I've ever seen in my life were really simple people. They were not fancy people. Okay. They didn't have smart homes. They were quiet, focused individuals who decided they wanted to be great at something and they just focused on it and their life were really simple. Um, John Smith, six-time world champion wrestler, he says, I wanted to live like a Spartan on a cheap budget because he said I had noticed from previous experience when I just focus intensely and simplify my life, I perform better. Six-time world champ. And that's the kind of thing I've seen. A simple life. You only got so much time. You got time for, you need a job of some sort, whatever that might be to make some money, to pay your bills, get some food. And then you got some obligations to your family and friends and you meet, try to meet that. And then you've got a little bit of time left over for your hobby or your interest, whatever it might be. So that's about it. That's about all the time there is. So you don't want to waste any time. You really would want more time for each of those things. So um, anyways, I uh, hope that's helpful. That's it. Oh boy. Wait, let me get myself back on screen. I took myself off and I don't know how to get myself on. Oh my I can God. see you. Oh, you can see me. Okay, yeah. I think I'm back. Hey, so okay. Um, do you want to do you want to stop the share or I can stop it? Oh yeah, I'm done with it. I'm done with it. Let me see if I can stop it. You can there stop we go. It. There now I can see you nice and big. Where? How do you research all all your shows, Doctor? Uh, well, I have a secret. Did I ever tell you about my magic bathroom? <laughs> I think you know so. I, <laughs> yeah, basically, I saw Mozart. He had wrote to one of his friends. He had diarrhea for a while and he wrote a letter to his friend. I think it only fitting to write while shitting. And I thought to myself, you know what? That's kind of clever. Why waste that time? So I put a little portable table in my bathroom. I saw the Monty Python skit where they said, every sperm is sacred. And I thought, you know what? Every void is sacred. So I'll always read a paperback. So I got a little bookshelf and a little table in, in, in the bathroom right next to the loo there. And so I always read a, at least one paperback every week in there. Um, I'll read a textbook during number twos. And then in the car, I always listen to an audiobook. And um, I'll, I'll have a note card and I'll, I'll if, I, if I get an interesting idea, like currently I'm listening to a book called Oxygen by Nicholas, uh, I think it's Nicholas Cage. He, um, he wrote the other book, Transformer 2. He's a biologist, biochemist who studies the origin of life and the biochemistry of it. And anyways, I pick up some interesting thoughts on oxygen and oxidative stress from that. And then what I also do is I try to read an article while I'm eating dinner or watch an educational video. And I just have the philosophy. I work full time. I mean, I wish I could retire and just do this stuff full time, but I can't because I got kids in school. I got to help pay their tuitions. So anyways, I'm constantly grabbing at knowledge wherever I can get it. And it just adds up. And then I'm pretty good at having what I would call an information management system. So I'll all collect it into a file and then I just organize it and I'm ready to go. And it's kind of fun for me to do it. You know, it took me all these years to accumulate all this knowledge. I'm happy to share it. Well, good. It seems like you really enjoy it. Yeah, I do. I sort of feel like that's like my purpose. You know what I mean? You got to you gotta go with what you got. You know, you know, if you're seven feet tall, you can play basketball. Okay. I'm not seven feet tall. Okay. Uh, and if you're a certain age or you live in a certain place, different things become available to you. And it's almost like, for me, the thing that's available is I can sit down, read and study and give lectures about it and make videos about it. And so I think that's about the best way I can spend my time at this part of my life. Did you always want to be a doctor? Yeah, I wanted to be a doctor, but it was kind of weird. When I was in high school, I was a great athlete. I wanted to be national champion, Olympic champion, then be a college coach like the University of Iowa or some other great wrestling team. And I love being a wrestler and it was fun. Wrestlers are good guys, real honest, no bullshit. And it's fun to compete. And so that's how I envisioned my life. And then all of a sudden I got injured and I'm like, oh my God, it's like I lost my identity. I no longer, I couldn't compete in the state tournament my senior year. That's how I got recruited to Stanford. And it was then like I had to reinvent myself. And I realized... I'm going to just try to become a great doctor, great scientist. My dad was a doctor. My parents, of course, wanted me to be a doctor, if you will. And so then I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just pushed as hard as I could. And I think it was essentially Alfred Adler inferiority complex. I felt so bad that all my friends went on to be like World Cup champions, all Americans, national champions. My coaches were World and Olympic fans. And I'm like the low man on the totem pole. And I was so pissed off that I was always a low man on the totem pole with my friends. Um, that I, I super compensated in, in my academics. And that's why I was kind of like, and also as at Stanford, there's nothing to do. And in, in Stanford, they say nine out of 10 California girls are pretty in the tenth one goes to Stanford. And wrestlers were like low life thugs, scumbags on campus. No one cared about wrestling at all over there. 
And so what I'm trying to say is I never dated one girl at Stanford. I asked one girl out. I had done her homework for her the whole semester for the really quarter system. And then she like laughed in my face when I asked her out. And so what I'm trying to say is I had a lot of lonely nights to study. Uh, but anyways, you know, and, I, and then as I studied more and developed more, I realized that I could try to do something great. And I wanted to do something great. It was almost like I could make my life fun and happy again, like it had been back in the good old wrestling days. And so I really pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed for that. And then I kind of freaked out in the sense that I, I sort of learned when I got fat myself and my parents got sick, oh my gosh, conventional medicine can't really do much. Where are the answers? Do they even exist? And so I would just spend tons of time plowing through all these journal articles and then later on watching the YouTube videos. This is before, you know, the internet was widespread. Um, and then I started learning all this stuff and I'm like, oh my gosh, all this good information is here. Um, people should know more about it. Speaking of wrestling, one of the viewers are saying, have you ever had to use your wrestling skills in the real world? <laughs> well, I'm pretty much uh, of a chicken in the sense that I avoid problems. You know what I mean? I don't go to a bar. I don't, I avoid trouble. So I think the best way to handle those situations is to avoid them. And I pretty much don't do anything. Did I tell you like what one of my kids said to me about going to medicine? And you know, I asked my kid, you want to be a doctor? And he goes, dad, look at your life. He goes, I drive around all the rich neighborhoods. I got friends in the rich neighborhoods. Most of these people, they're not doctors. He goes, look at you. You work almost all the time. And when you're not working, you're studying, you're writing your books or your videos and stuff. He goes, what kind of a life is that? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Dixie says, should we turn off our routers when we're not using Wi-Fi? That would be best. Yeah. Because there's so many cell phone towers, you probably still have decent cell phone reception. And so why have your Wi-Fi on if you don't need it? Or even hardwire would be even better if you could. But to turn it off, yeah, that would be a smart thing to do. Great. And guys, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask. You can be putting um, the question marks first, if you don't mind. Pat says, do earbuds hurt your brain? Well, if, the, if they're communicating electronically with, let's say, your cell phone or something or your computer, then there's some electrical EMF being put around your brain. They have air tubes, which have less of an electronic, uh, the electronics component of it are more distant from your brain. Um, so, you know, you can't completely avoid this stuff, but again, minimize it. Like what I would do is have the speaker on if you can. I know sometimes you're in a house with a family, other people are asleep. So it's hard to do that. Okay. But to the extent you can always be thinking, how can I keep this at a further distance in me, from me or decrease EMF related to it to the extent you can. Great. Thank you. Richard, who's both watching live and sent in a question in advance said, can you ask Dr. Rogers about blood pressure? Because people were saying his was too low at 100 over 65, which he thought it was ridiculous. And I posted my blood pressure 86 over 56. And people were telling me I need to go to the emergency room. So can you comment on how low is too low? And, and what is a normal blood pressure? Well, a lot of times people say normal blood pressure, something like 110 over 70. But of course, it depends on the individual. In, you know, when babies are born, there's something like about 90 over 60. And if they eat a plant-based diet all of their life, it doesn't change that much from that. It might go up to 105 over 70 or something, but there's virtually zero hypertension in like Tata Humata or the Yanomamo uh, communities where they eat plant-based diet all their life. So a person who's healthy, as long as you feel good, you can run a chronically low blood pressure. It's a sign of health. Typical American, they've been hypertensive for decades and they've exhausted all the elastic fibers in their ascending thoracic aorta, which is like a second heart. When the when your left ventricle contracts your heart, it pushes blood into your ascending thoracic aorta, that expands outward. And then the elastic recoil during diastole, when the heart relaxes, it elastic recoils inward and that maintains flow during diastole. And Americans routinely have trashed their ascending thoracic aorta elastic fibers. So they'll have chronic systolic hypertension. So what I'm saying is if you feel good and you have good exercise tolerance, good concentration, then that's probably a normal blood pressure for you. Yeah. I mean, and, and these people were saying, well, I've worked in an emergency room for 22 years. And if you came in with that, we'd be starting you on medication. I mean, wouldn't the doctor that saw the blood pressure tell me it was too low if it was too low? Yeah. Well, they, they, they would worry about it because the way an emergency room doctor thinks is their job is to worry about the worst case scenario and deal with that. If they overdo it initially, so what? But if they miss it, they're screwing up because they're thinking, okay, the guy's hypotensive. Perhaps he has an intra-abdominal bleed. Maybe we got a CT scan and check his abdomen. Does he have any pain? Is his abdomen bloated? You know what I mean? They're worried. They, the first thing they ask themselves in an emergency room is, what's the worst possible thing this could be? We don't want to miss that. So that's how they're going to think. But, you know, like if you, you know the person, they're repeatedly that low, they've been that low, and they feel good and their exercise is good, their concentration is good, then that's just what their pressure is. 
Yeah. Well, and the you. other thing too is when you when you hear like if you said to me, 60 year old man, what does that mean? That doesn't mean to me that he's 60 years old. As soon as you say to me, 60 year old man, I'm 60 year old, by the way. But when I hear that about a patient, to me that means overweight, diabetes or pre-diabetes at least, hypertensive, probably has coronary artery disease, probably has cerebrovascular disease, probably has erectile dysfunction. Don't be surprised you got all the other stuff, you know, prostate dysplasia, prostate cancer, gastroesophageal reflux. You just know any person living in a Western society who eats the Western diet, they usually have all those things. So 60 year old, 70 year old, I, I immediately expect a certain amount of brain atrophy, a certain amount of spinal degeneration just by hearing those words. Okay, so that's how people in a hospital think. They expect the patient to be sick. In the United States, patient over 60, they expect you to be cognitively slow. It's just how it is, but it doesn't have to be that way. And people who live a healthy life and a healthy diet, they don't have to be all those things. Thank you. What do you suggest from shielding from outside EMF? Yeah, well, that's what I told you I do with my bed, okay? Because that's where I have to, you know, obviously spend a lot of time every day. So I do it there. Um, and I've done other things too. I shield my office. I have I have outward facing mirrors all around my office. Um, so I try to expose and minimize my exposure in that way. Um, I would never, you know, hold a cell phone up next to my head, you know, unless it was an emergency, which is, you know, something once every couple of years at the most. Uh, so that, that's what I would do. I mean, there's more you can do. You can go to all these sites about EMF safety and stuff. You can, you can, you know, paint your, paint your house with this EMF protective paint. You can do all kinds of things, but I don't know. For me, I thought that was simple. I'd heard that that's effective. I, hopefully I'm not screwing up, but that's what I heard, you know, these, these mirrors, uh, you know, for what that's worth. Um, and then the Faraday uh, sort of tent around the bed. Um, so anyways, do what you can. You'll see there's a whole bunch of information on the internet about this stuff. Now that you're aware of it, you know, the first step is to become aware of it. Once you're aware of it, then you can figure out what to do. I think it was Amelia Earhart. She had a good quote. She said, the most important and the most difficult decision is to make the decision to act. Once you've made the decision to act, all the rest is simply a matter of tenacity. And that's about what it comes down to. Okay, you decided you're gonna shield from EMF, figure out if you can turn off your Wi-Fi and figure out everything else you can do. Make a list of your entire day in 30 minute increments and say to yourself, am I unnecessarily being exposed in any of these? What could I do about it? Thank you. Here's a question. And it is about grounding. Has Dr. Ron Rogers ever investigated this? One of the whole food plant-based people is recommending it. And I, there's something called the earthing movie. It's supposed to improve blood flow and sleep and protect from EMFs by exposing people through their skin to negative ions. Do you think there's anything to this? Could the electrical stimulation from the earth support health or is it potentially dangerous? Well, yeah, I remember I've heard of this off and on over the last couple of decades. And I think the best writer that that mentioned this is that Stephanie Seneth lady. She's a real smart PhD lady, lady from MIT. She's the one that writes about glyphosate all the time. And the gist of it being like the cholesterol sulfates, negative charges on the endothelial glycocalyx. Okay. In the human body, red blood cells have what's called a zeta potential around themselves, meaning a negative negative charge because of cholesterol sulfates, because of, uh, you know, sialic acids, for example, which is like a glucuronic acid attached to a glucose. Anyways, they'll have a negative charge around themselves. And the benefit of it is the other RBC will have that negative charge. So they bounce off of each other. They repel each other, which is what you want. You don't want your red blood cells sticking together and forming a clot. And then the endothelium has a lining. It's called a glycocalyx. They're like trees sticking up from the side of a hill. And they also have a negative charge on them. So do the white blood cells. They all have zeta potentials, negative charges on their outer surfaces, so they don't stick together. Okay, so the gist of it, what Stephanie Seneff says, she says, when you walk barefoot outdoors, you get some negative charges from the earth come into your foot and that they help replenish the negative charges of your zeta potential. So do I know for sure if that's true? No, I don't know. But I think we all know there's few things in life that feel better than walking on the beach in the sunshine, <laughs> you know, uh, in the water. I mean, that's about like as good as life gets in terms of the physical feeling of being outdoors. So I think there might be some truth to it. You know, you certainly got to make sure you're in a place where it's safe to walk barefoot. OK, uh, but there, I think there might be some truth to it. I think she might be right, because that lady, Stephanie Seneff, you know, when I would double check the things she says, there was usually, you know, pretty good science behind them, except, you know, she doesn't know nutrition, you know. None of these PhDs practically know nutrition. Okay. So that, but that's another side. I wouldn't trust her advice on nutrition. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, there might be something to it along those lines. Somehow it somehow helps replenish negative charges, which are beneficial to one's endothelial glycocalyx, thus making our blood less coagulable. 
you know, that, that's the gist of what I got from it. And I know it feels good for what that's worth. Thank you. Jean says, you said that Tylenol was detrimental to our mitochondria and should be avoided. Acetaminophen of one gram a day is the only thing that makes my multiple spinal compression fracture pain t- tolerable at age 80 because I avoid opioids. Okay, well, I would I would rather see Tylenol than opioids because opioids are pretty dangerous and pretty dangerous. So it's underestimated by people how dangerous they are. I know a bunch of people who had a family member or a relative die because of opioid overdose. They're real dangerous. Mm-hmm. I also I remember I used to run a pain management clinic where I used to do all the spinal epidural steroids and uh, selective nerve root blocks and all that kind of stuff. And there was a lot of pressure on us to prescribe opioids, which I didn't do, but there was pressure on us to do that. You know, I had a friend who's an anesthesiologist that worked with the clinic and what what whatnot. And he would take care of that stuff and sell them do it too. But what I'm trying to say is those are dangerous. If you have to, sometimes you have to do something. Okay, if that's what's working for your pain, then fine, do it. But just don't add to it with anything else. Don't eat any processed food, you know, to the extent you can. She's saying a a vertebroplasty, a procedure done by an interventional neuroradiologist. Would you recommend that? Oh, it really depends on her pattern of fractures and how she's doing. You know, I tend to be of a frame of mind. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If you're getting around okay on a follow-up film, the fracture's been stabilized and you're getting by reasonably well, then you might just be happy with that. But if you have a severe unlivable debility, you know, from retropulsion and it's pushing on your, your spinal cord or your cauda equina or something, maybe you need it. So, you know, a lot of these decisions, they're, they're a question of, you know, the nuance. If you're getting, if basically, if you're doing okay, why take a chance on the vertebroplasty? If you're really not doing well, maybe the vertebroplasty will help you. But it's still, you know, it's a pretty significant procedure. They got to put you on your stomach, drill through the pedicle, get a big honking needle in there. I don't know, 11 gauge or something and inject bone cement in there, you know, and is it that, might help a lot of times. Is that something that you do? Is that one of your procedures? I, I did, a, I assisted on some earlier in my career. I used to do a lot of spinal biopsies where I would drill through the pedicle, but I don't do those anymore. It was sort of like I had this idea that I was going to become a neurointerventionalist. When I did my fellowship in neuroradiology, I actually initially did a double fellowship, combined neurointerventional, like endo- endovascular brain surgery, as well as these spine procedures. And I trained with a guy actually who invented one of these spinal needles. Okay. Wow. But, but then what happened was I saw neurosurgeries taking over endovascular neurosurgery. So I'm like, okay, forget it. You know, cause a 19 year full professor got pushed out. It's actually Glenn Jeremiah. He's the guy who invented the needle, the Jeremiah needle. Okay. And he was, he was a great neurointerventionist. And I'm like, this guy's a 19 year full professor and he's getting pushed out. How am I, you know, a young guy going to make a career in this field, forget this. So I said, forget endovascular interventional neuro. And I just went with conventional diagnostic neuro in that context. Um, but anyways, uh, like I said, every procedure has got risk benefits and alternatives. And my attitude is always, you don't take the risk unless there's a big benefit and you sort of need to. I don't, I don't just go things for the heck of it because, you know, problems do happen. You know, pe- patients tend to think everything always works and there's no complications. In reality, complications happen. So you don't, you don't take the chance unless you have to. Great. Thank you. Uh, TS asks, have you seen the white spots in the brain diminish with a whole food plant-based diet or is that scarring that doesn't go away? Okay. Yeah. I'll answer the question about the periventricular flare hyperintensity. Just more. I'll just tell you one funny thing. I had a family member who wanted to go for spine surgery and I looked at their films and I thought that if they just waited about a year, their disc herniation would probably regress. And then they went to another family member who doesn't know anything about spine, a physician also, but doesn't know anything about spine and said, Oh, I'll just go ahead with the surgery. And they had a good outcome. Okay. So in my family, and by the way, I've written several books on spine. I'm like a world-class expert on spine, but in my family, they all just called me chicken shit for a couple of years. Oh, you're chicken. You're scared of everything because I didn't recommend surgery. So what I'm trying to say is it's very easy to think it, just go ahead and do stuff and you might get lucky here and there, but I've seen a lot of spinal disasters too. And, you know, so I don't go there. Okay. getting back to the question now, paraventricular flare hyperintensities. Um, I don't see them reverse. Okay. I've maybe seen it reverse once, but usually by the time you've got a positive abnormal signal on your brain MRI, typically it's in the periventricular regions, the corona radiata and the sequence you see it on is usually flare. So it's usually called a, a periventricular flare hyperintensity bright spot. You know, you go back in time about 20 years ago, they used to call these UBOs, unidentified, uh, unidentified bright spots or unknown bright spots. And what they, I think they really are is small silent strokes. So you're not going to get them to go away, but you want, you want to do is just, you know, play the ball where it's at and, Try not to ever get any more of them. And the typical way to be healthy, what optimizes blood flow? Low fat, low sodium, vegan diet. You know, um, that's what I do because that's what works. 
Uh, so that's what I would do. But, you know, be careful if you're already taking medicines for diabetes or for hypertension and you change your diet, you're probably going to need to lower your medication dosages. So you got to work with your doctor to titrate those dosages down because you don't want to be over treating hypertension. You can be hypotensive. You don't want to over treat diabetes. You can become hypoglycemic. So you got to work with your doctor to get the dosages correct. Thank you. Uh, Dixie says, is it my, if my, na my neighbor's wife, oh, where did it go? What do you think about my neighbor's Wi-Fi coming into my house? When I sign into my Wi-Fi, I have like eight choices to choose from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that means you're getting more exposure, you know? So you can do these things. I just talked about the shield for what that's worth. Um, see if that helps. Yeah. Um, what about Bluetooth headphones, asks Gina. Are those a better choice and for children? Those give some EMF. I would best recommend they avoid all that stuff as much as they can. I think all this modern stuff, I, I really don't like it. And I don't think it helps children. Um, like, you know, a lot of these kids play video games and young boys get addicted to video games. And it makes them kind of crazy. Um, I had a problem with one of my sons was addicted to video games and, uh, he, he started, he was a, like an A student. Then he started flunking all his classes in school. He would wake up early on a weekend to play video games or he'd have friends come over, to play video games, or they would play online video games with strangers, all kinds of craziness where they were just obsessed with it. Um, and eventually I got rid of it and he hated me and he wouldn't speak to me for six months. Uh, so I don't know what the kids wearing the, those Bluetooth, or those ear tubes for, but I think video games are bad. And I think cell phones are bad for children. I think cell phones make children stupid. That's my opinion that what also happens is Ayn Rand wrote a great book, a great uh, essay about this. Her essay was called Compra Chicos. Okay. And the gist of it was that when a child is around adults or older persons, like an older sibling or something, they learn stuff because the older person knows more than they do about a lot of things. When they get a cell phone, all of a sudden, the entire world becomes irrelevant other than their peer group. And they're constantly texting each other. They're very tied in, you know, 24 seven to their peer group. And you'll have all kinds of problems with kids. They'll try to sleep next to their phone in case they get a message, they can send a text back. Um, you know, it's next to their head all night long. They freak out if you try to take it away from them. And what I'm trying to say, like I mentioned with my daughter that I was very unhappy about that, that she became a different person once she got a cell phone. She had zero interest in speaking to me again or zero interest in reading books. All that mattered was their social life. So I'm not a fan of cell phones and electronics for kids. I think a lot of like the rich, smart people, the sort of famous billionaires, a lot of them, they'll put their kids in a school with no Wi-Fi, even better yet, no computer. Read a book, have a conversation, interact with the world. I think that makes you smarter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, this is really... Um... This is an interesting question. When you were younger, did you have any food addictive behaviors or were you just eating the wrong food? Well, I didn't. The reason I got fat in my mid thirties was I kind of just mentioned it. I tried to do two fellowships simultaneously, diagnostic neuroradiology with endovascular brain surgery and, you know, neurointerventional it's also called. So I was working a super long day, then had a wife at home with the baby. That same year, I authored a textbook. I wrote the pocket radiologist book of inter interventional radiology for Amersys Elsevier. Okay. So that's a lot to do in one year. Plus I wrote the fellowship manuals for interventional procedures at, during the fellowship program. And I also wrote the MRI CT neuroradiology protocols for how to run the CAT scan and the MRI machines. Okay. So I did a lot of stuff in one year and I wasn't sleeping hardly at all. And I got fat. I ballooned up. I'm about five foot nine. And I ballooned up to 220 pounds, which is fat for me. And then I just figured, well, no big deal. Exercise more and uh, and eat less. I'll lose the weight, you know. And then afterwards, but I couldn't lose the weight for a couple of years. And then my sister-in-law, she said to me, you know, if you know so much about nutrition, Mr. Doctor, why are you so fat? And that's when I realized I really got to start studying to figure this all out. But that's why I became fat. Because well, I wasn't sleeping, I started drinking those frappuccinos. I was drinking like uh, five of those a day. And I would eat pop tarts or whatever I could get my hands on quick because I was always in a hurry. Um, it was stupid, but I didn't know any better. And, and by the way, I was like one of the best biochemistry students in the entire United States when I was in medical school. Nutrition wasn't included. They say nutrition is included, but they don't really teach you any nutrition. They don't teach you what to eat. They don't teach you anything. All they say is high cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. So um, I learned the hard way. Uh, luckily, though, once I started studying nutrition, I, I lost the weight and Everything else has been fine since then. And I progressively gotten more careful as I've gotten older because you get more fragile as you get older. So you got to be more careful if you want to stay healthy. Right. Are you familiar with something called Lipogems, a newer procedure to help of knee heal? 
What is that? Like injecting something in the knee I'm, or something? I'm not sure Richard is asking if you recommend it. It has something to do with liposuction on the knee, it sounds like. He says, according to studies. Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with that procedure. What I could say is, though, again, I would maximize everything I could with the whole, you know, low fat, low sodium, vegan, all that kind of stuff. And then afterwards, make a decision based on that. But I, I don't have experience with that procedure, so I don't know. People are asking if you if you think colonoscopies are safe and what sedation one should get for a colonoscopy. I can tell you, I usually think the way McDougal does on a lot of things. And I think McDougal's really smart and he really knows literature well. And he's a pretty big nerd. He sits around reading all, all the time, you know, and now he's retired. So he's got even more time to read. I'm jealous of him. Okay. He studied these things pretty carefully. He's a smart guy. All right. So I, I trust what he says. And again, I'll just give you, I'm going to tell you this joke again. You might've heard me say it before, but it's from the movie Colors with Robert Duvall and Sean Penn in Los Angeles. It was sort of about the gangs in Los Angeles, but the gist of it is the, there was an old cop and young cop, okay? And there's an old bull and a young bull that's on top of a hill, okay? And the young bull says to the old bull, look down there in the valley, all those cows walking around. Why don't we run down there and we can have sex with one of those cows? And then the old bull says, why don't we walk down there and have sex with all of them, okay? And so what I'm trying to talk about here is conventional medicine always says, this is atherosclerosis, high cholesterol, take this pill. This is high blood pressure, take this pill and this pill, okay? This is hiatal hernia, gastroesophageal reflux, take this pill. It divides all these illnesses into different things and says, take all these different pills, they're all separate things. And what I'm saying is when you go low fat, low sodium, vegan, manage your stress, get your exercise, get your sunshine, maintain your social support, you do that, you tend to cure a whole bunch of things and you don't have any side effects from doing it. So what I'm saying is you wanna max out on all that stuff first, all the advantage and benefit you can get without any side effects. And if you still have a problem, maybe you do need something more than that. Maybe you do need a surgery. Maybe you do need a pill, but why not get all the benefit you can get free of charge, so to speak, free of side effect. So I would do all that stuff first. But I know from personal experience, even talking to the family members and physicians and all this stuff, quite often people always want to look for a quick fix, but most of the time there is no quick fix. So it's good to you know do what you can first. Anyways, that's kind of what I would say. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. This was wonderful as usual. Well, thanks. Great. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 11 a.m. tomorrow for Plant-Based Classics with Lauren Burnick. She's going to be doing a vegan dessert palooza and making lemon bars and chocolate peanut butter ice cream. Vegan, of course. What do you plan for Thanksgiving, Dr. Rogers? Well, you know what they say for a middle-aged man, life's pretty easy. When you're at work, you just do what you're supposed to over there. When you're at home, you just do whatever the wife says. I don't ever plan anything. <laughs> Do you do anything special? Is it a vegan Thanksgiving? Uh, well, they always make some vegan food for me. I'm the only 100% vegan in my circle. But I can tell you, the more time goes by, the more everybody sees that I'm right. That's what always kind of happens, okay? Um, and so they all see that. Out of all the extended family, out of all my doctor friends, all my hospital friends, I'm aging the best. I'm 60 years old, okay? I don't got nothing wrong with me. All right? Um, so... But most people, they just won't take that challenge. I think kind of like they got herbivore physiology, you know, flat teeth to chew plant foods and a jaw that goes side to side. They also tend to have herbivore mentalities. You know, the herbivore, the safe place to be is in the middle of the fat, the pack, conformist, all right? But in, in the modern world, that just gets you, you know, all these Western diseases. So, uh, but as far as, yeah, social stuff, I also notice, you know, I don't have that much energy. It's sort of like I put the little energy I have into my academic science stuff and into my weightlifting and stuff like that. So I don't really have too much because in the end, I'm going to have to do what the wife says anyways. So why even bother thinking about it is kind of how I look at it. All right. Thanks, Dr. Rogers. It's always a pleasure. Yeah. Take care, everyone. Have a great Sunday. Bye-bye. Yep.